So this is the review of Sadomasochists from Beyond the Grave. Ah, what a woman will do for a good fuck. Yeah, 1987's Hellraiser. So, once again, happy Spooktober. This is, as you can probably imagine, if you look at the date, the last Spooktober review from me for this year. So. It's Halloween, we're watching scary movies, we're eating Halloween pizza. Don't worry, it doesn't actually taste like pumpkin, that would probably be repulsive. The orange looking stuff is just cheddar and cut up tomato. So, you know that thing where everybody tells you that a movie's really great, and you get it really built up in your head, and, and you watch it, and it didn't really work for you at all? I do, but not with this one. What's that? You thought I would be doing a video on the 22, 2022 film? Same. I had thought that it being on Hulu and me having Disney Plus in Europe meant I would get it, but apparently not, so I decided to do this one since I freaking love it. This is not me making lemonade out of lemons. This is me gushing, not blood, over a classic. So I I found this puzzle box and, and I solved it. Well, good thing it's not the lament configuration. That's probably way too much intro. So, yes, this video will definitely have some jokes, and I will get serious in a bunch of it. So, if you're looking for a review that talks about, you know, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by later movies, because of that it's no longer that much fun to watch today, and or, you know, it, it's not a correct adaptation, it's, it's not an accurate adaptation, so it sucks, whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. I will go into the politics. And yeah, so I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. And as soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for both the movie and the source material. I'll also be discussing the ending. I I probably won't get into details about the sequels. So, content warning and or trigger warning. This features torture, kidnapping, ableism, domestic abuse, gaslighting, xenophobia, murder, grief, body horror, and let's see, yeah. So, um, yeah, the movie is rated R, and so is this video. And yeah, so uh, on IMDb, there are no details for why the MPA rated it an R, but I'm guessing it's probably violence and sex. There's there is some swearing, but yeah. It's probably especially the violence, although apparently the sex was also something that, you know, some some of the censors freaked out about, which is kind of funny, considering how it's it's remarkably mild compared to like today's standards. Now regardless of whether you love or hate the you know, this movie, the franchise you know, Clive Barker in general, you know, I don't hate you. If you enjoyed a movie that I like, that's great. I have absolutely no problem with that. So, that brings us to the... Um, Right, so it's difficult to compare this to other horror movies because it is, it it has some very different elements from, but you know the one subgenre that people will sometimes try to place this as. Although I completely disagree with this kind of characterization of the movie, a number of people compare it to slasher movies. So. Yeah, you know, I I enjoy slasher movies a lot. I've watched most of the classics. And let's 
see. That brings us... Right, since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you I washed my hands since last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. And... Let's see. So, yeah, I, you know, I watched the version. I, I believe the version I watched is the theatrical. I'm aware that it's not exactly uncensored. Like there's stuff not in it that Clive Barker would have wanted in it. And I would like to watch one that has that stuff. I don't know if anyone has done that though. But yeah, it's not like uh, edited for TV or something. I honestly don't know when, uh, I must have watched this around the year 2000, and the, yeah, uh, I've probably watched at least a dozen times total, and my most recent viewing was right before hitting record on this video. So the plot and I'm gonna keep this very vague for those who are watching this video and have not yet watched the movie because this really is you should know very very little so after the disappearance of his brother Frank Larry moves into their mother's house with his wife Julia but what happened to Frank and what is that weird thumping noise in that one room upstairs Honestly, the first time you watch this, provided no one spoiled it for you, the mystery is incredible. You genuinely do not know what's going on until the movie makes it clear. I would be extremely surprised if anyone guessed it without significant hints or pop culture osmosis. So... Let's see... Um... Right, that brings us to the writing. So, this, both the the script and the short story were written by Clive Barker. And, yeah, if, you know, he has written a couple of other things that have been made into movies, including Dread... Let's see, Book of Blood, Candyman, Midnight Meat Train, and Lord of Illusions. Oh, right, and and Nightbreed, Rawhead Rex, under well, yeah, I yeah. And he's you know, he's also wrote, written a couple of video games, including Jericho Demonique and Undying. And yeah. You know, Undying, I don't love that game, but there's definitely some really good things to it. And he directed three movies, including this one. Other than this, Nightbreed and Lord of Illusions were, yeah. And he also directed a couple of shorts. The Forbidden, which is not based on Candyman, even though it's, you might think, since the short story... Candyman is, uh, yes, The Forbidden. And he d directed Salome, or Sa I'm guessing that's how you pronounce it, from 1973, which is based on the Oscar Wilde play, which is indeed wild. So, a uh, brief, uh, yeah, so the, the written, uh, let's see. Yeah. All of his written works adapted into movies other than this one, ranked worst to best, and I respect them all as being well written. Candyman Farewell to the Flesh, which he wrote the story for. Dread, which, yeah, he, he only wrote the story for. And yeah, let's see. Hellbound Hellraiser 2, based on story by Candyman 1992 and Candyman 2021. 
and for yeah, the Candyman, the the original and the the twenty twenty one movie are based on the Forbidden, his short story. So yeah, um, you can tell that he's not used to writing movies, but a lot of the time he does a really really good job. The 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 characters are interesting, and you know I I would say that the characters are more interesting than almost any slash movie I've watched, especially the the eighties ones. They're fun, but they're not exactly Shakespeare. And yeah, the the various ideas he brings up, the the various kind of yeah, some of the some of the things that happen in the movie are very cleverly thought up. So the this movie does a really great job on plot twists. There are not too many. They're not bad. Perhaps one of them is this, and there are not too few. They're not too easy to figure out for the. I I would say there's one that for sure it's like it's not difficult to figure out. I don't think it's meant to be a twist. I've seen a couple of other people say that wasn't much of a twist. I don't think it's supposed to be. I think it's supposed to be the, like, the classic tragedy, you know, the Greek tragedy kind of thing, where you know where things are going, but you, you know, you're helpless to do anything but watch things unfold. It, it's, I really don't think we're supposed to be surprised by it. Moving on to direction, which, again, is Clive Barker. And... Yeah, so the yeah the the this is the only of the three movies that he's directed, and I have not watched either of his shorts that I've seen by him. Now, yeah, um, so I've only watched four of the Hellraiser movies. So worst to best of the yeah worst to best of the sequels. And I don't particularly, I, yeah. Worst to best of the sequels, Hellseeker, Inferno, and Hellbound. I respect Hellbound, and I do appreciate that it has a lot of Barker's vision. I do not think it is as good of a movie as this. And, yeah, haven't watched any of the others. I have watched reviews of them by D.S. Deacon, Dacre Shadow, Phalus. I'm not sure I would disagree with them if I did watch those films. Yes, I realize on this channel I used to watch every entry in a horror movie series, do videos on them all. I'm not really that interested in doing that anymore. If someone very badly wants me to review at least one of the sequels, let me know which one. I will strongly consider it. And, yeah, some aspects of the film are clearly British and others American, and that's because it was made in Britain by Brits, and then some stuff was changed, dubbing, for example, to sell it to Americans. Some people feel that this is a detriment to the film. I kind of think it really works, and for sure, like, it, you know, it wasn't something I really thought about before I started researching this, you know. Like, a year ago, I wasn't thinking about the you know, that kind of thing at all, but... You know, a, a bunch of people provided examples, and it's, for example, I want to say maybe, like, there's, like, a policeman who's, like, yeah, the what the police wear in Britain versus America is very, yeah. And, you know, some of the people have American accents, and there's, like, there's not, I don't think there's many, very many British accents left, but it's not completely un... you know, so, so yeah, the, like, essentially the world that this movie takes place in is this strange amalgam of Britain and America that doesn't exist anywhere in the real world, and I kind of think that works for it, like, because this is, like, yeah, it's not a spoiler to say there are fantasy elements in this movie, and... Yeah, the fact that it is kind of like it's it's everywhere in Britain and America, and yet nowhere in Britain and America. That I I kind of think it works, you know. And yeah, for sure, direction you can you can really tell. You know, for the for the screenplay, at the very least, he had written a bunch of stories by the time 
that he wrote the screenplay for this, but he had only directed those two shorts. You know, the other movies that he directed were after this, and, you know, he, he admits, like, he's, he's the first to admit, he really did, like, so apparently, like, he, he told the, the studio people, I know exactly how to direct, and then he went directly to the library and asked, do you have any books on movie direction? Because he had not read any, he hadn't taken any classes, nothing. And... I've I've had trouble uh, finding a, a clear source. Some people's you know something that people agree on is that there were two books on direction. The the library had two books on direction. Now one source says both of them were checked out, so he had to, you know so he didn't he wasn't able to read anything before directing. Others say that one of the two were you know not at the uh, were were lent lent out whatever you call it and so he got the other one and read that one and you know but but either way yeah like it's it has this quality that you would not get from a seasoned director or even just one who's you know been through film school you know so just even you know i've i've never seen any other movie that quite like I, I I saw one person say it has this gonzo quality and that's absolutely correct like it really like he does things that you wouldn't expect to see in a movie and you know obviously like since this you know like if you try to watch if, if you haven't watched a new horror movie in a while like today they go much much further you know it, there's kind of an expectation you know same as action movies are bigger you know yeah, just, and, yeah, like, he he does things that you hadn't seen before, and, you know, some, some of them have been done again since, but it's because this movie showed that it can work, you know, it's, that that's the thing, if you go to, for example, film school, they're gonna tell you what worked in the past, they're not necessarily... No, I'm I'm not hating on film school. Some some extremely talented people have come out of film school, but you know the thing with school, the thing with traditional education is they don't always ask you to try new things as much as they tell you this is what has been done and we know it works, and you know that's important. There's there's definitely you. I've I've always said rules. You know, some some people say rules are meant to be broken. I like to say rules are meant to be understood, and then you start deciding whether or not to break them. You shouldn't break a rule just because it's a rule, just just to break rules, in my opinion. And yeah, like you know, it's not like he had never watched a movie. He knew, you know, he he just hadn't tried making a professional one before. And, you know, it's not like that kind of makes it sound like, oh, wow, it must be a train rate. No, 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 he had a professional crew, you know, but yeah, he, he talks about at the, at, at first he did not know what, he couldn't tell the lenses apart, for example. And yeah, you know, the people, the, the, I'm guessing cinematographer, you know, was like patient enough to explain, okay, well, this lens has this effect, and this other lens has, you know, it, it wasn't like he just said, okay, let's, let's just go, I guess, you know, this is, this is not like Mano's Hands of Fate, this is not, I suppose, I'm, I would argue that nothing about this is outright incompetent, it's, it's, almost never less than competent, I've seen, there, you know, some of the acting is a little awkward, but, yeah, it's never less than competent, and it's very frequently interesting in the way that it goes. So the opening does a really great job of, of setting up the rest of the movie. You know, you get a very strong sense that a specific item is important for the wrong reason, and you see, you very soon see part of why. And, yeah, the opening titles are sadly just the very standard, you know, the score is great, but 
Other than that, it's just white text on black background, and I don't really blame them because there's so much creativity in the movie itself. And I, I'm not sure... I mean, as, as far as I understand, like, basically all the money and time was spent on the movie itself. So, yeah, the, the, for the credits, they just went with the completely standard way, which wouldn't take very much time and would not cost very much money. You know, please do not judge this movie on the opening credits. The, the creativity kicks in as soon as the opening credits are over. In fact, the very first transition, the very first actual shot of the movie, and the transition to it from the credits, just... I love it. So, I am not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it fits with what came before with, you know, there's maybe one or two aspects of the ending that feel a little odd compared to what came before. And... I love the ending, except for the parts that I don't quite love. You know, I'm going to get into it in the in the thoughts sections. There is no Deus Ex Machina. There's no convenient writing. And... So, as an adaptation, first off, I recommend reading or listening through the original work. Solid writing, as the other stuff I've read by Clive Barker, which... You know, the, the short stories The Forbidden, later turned into Candyman, Dread adapted quite well in the 2008 movie, and the novel Abarat. So, the... Let's see... I think it was right here on, on YouTube that I found the original... I... Sh yeah, I'm gonna find it really, really quickly, I swear. So the, um, that's not the most useful thing. Um, yes, um, Clive Barker's The Hellbound Heart is right here on YouTube as an audiobook. So, you know, you don't have to go out and, and find it. And, yeah, so, back to this short story. I will talk about the details of it and the changes made in the second thoughts section. And, you know, one thing I will note is that Clive Barker is a very visual writer. He puts pictures in your head. You know, some writers are good at other things, but not so much that. So it makes a lot of sense for him to direct as well. And, yeah, so, you know, it's, an, it's a feature-length adaptation of a short story. I was very... I mean, I only listen to the audiobook of the short story after watching the movie, but if I had done it the other way around, I don't think I would... I, I would probably have thought, wow, they must have a lot of filler and, and padding, but but no, it actually... It, it fleshes out stuff. Like, it's important to note, when he wrote the short story, he was basically telling... Like, it's so that the studio could... You know, it, it's instead of him just going to a studio, knocking on the door and being like, I have an idea for a movie. I know I haven't directed before, and you know we don't. You're probably not gonna have enough money to attract like big names that can put asses in seats. But why are you kicking me out? Instead of that, he wrote a short story that you know it has the themes, the the you know a lot of the characters. Yeah. So he's basic, and I think he also got it published. So you know that that also maybe helps that he's I. I have a published story, it's my own story, I want to flesh it out into a movie, I have ideas, you know, and, you know, you can see that, but, but yeah, you know, yeah, honestly, it's, it's, I kind of wish more of, of these, that this would be done more, I, it, I'm not sure that it's never been done on any other movie, but I'm not sure I offhand know of another example. Like, so frequently with adaptations, it's like, oh, well, you know, 
the book is like a brick. We can't take everything from it. So let's just pluck a few things and stick them together with crazy glue and hope that people are just like, oh, I remember that instead of that was completely nonsensical. That didn't, you know, they didn't understand the book at all. Yeah, like, obviously a lot of people who write short stories are not necessarily the best at directing. I haven't, I don't think I've watched anything that Stephen King has directed, but I have been warned that it's terrible. But yeah, you know, when you can, this, yeah, this really worked out incredibly well. That brings us to the characters. So, Claire Higgins plays Julia Cotton, and I quite like that she's at the top of the... I, I copied in from Wikipedia. You know, some, some people wouldn't agree with me on this, but she is basically the main character. She's one of the most interesting characters in this by far, and, and again, much, much, so much more interesting than, than the, yeah, most of the slasher movie characters that I've, yeah. You know, she's married to, to Larry, as mentioned in the, in the plot section. And a really early example of how little she wanted to marry Larry, despite that it's fun that it rhymes, is that when she cheated on him with his brother Frank, they had sex on top of her wedding dress. The marriage was indeed doomed before it began, you know, and it was like a few days before the wedding. And Ashley Lawrence, then newcomer, played Kirsty Cotton, the daughter of Larry, but not Julia. And Andrew Robinson portrays Larry Cotton and the let's see yeah yeah it's it's you know if you think the the name is familiar if you just looked up his face and you feel like you recognize him he played i forget if they call him scorpio but it was based on the oh yeah yeah he's called scorpio it was based on the zodiac killer in the original Dirty Harry, and he plays Garrick in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And he, I, I have to admit, it's been a very long time since I watched Dirty Harry, but I remember him being excellent in that. And he really, he is absolutely incredible in, in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. You know, I... Uh, it's difficult, if, if you haven't watched Star Trek before, it can be kind of difficult to start with Deep Space Nine because it is, you're kind of expected to know some of the, the world, you know, some of the details already. But if you've never watched Star Trek and you just, you feel like, you know, ah, there's so many, there's so, so many different shows, so many episodes. I haven't watched any new Trek but of all, ah, crap, I think, do they call it Kelvin Time? Yeah, of, of everything before New Trek, Star Trek Deep Space Nine is the one that I would recommend people who want intelligent sci-fi and, like, character study. And Andrew Robinson is a very big part of why. And Sean Chapman plays Frank Cotton, and, oh, right, Robert Hines plays Steve, and, yeah, I'm not gonna get too much into the characters, because there are a lot of spoilers when it comes to them, but, yeah, I've, I've already said several of them are very interesting, and that is where I will leave it. I suppose I will just briefly say, you know, so so I mentioned that she she cheated on her husband. A lot of people really hate her character, and I just want to say, 
the movie has empathy for her, and I think that is that was the right choice in in how to deal with her character. And I think the more you learn about her character, the more you come to understand her, you know, yeah, like, she didn't, she's not just some, you know, I mean, Clive Barker is toying with the wicked stepmother stereotype, you know, which is right out of, like, classic fairy tales, you know, but he's, yeah, he's basically, like, saying, well, what if we tried to tell her story, and I don't mean in that uh, I have not watched the Maleficent movies. I forget if there are others. I feel like I've heard that there are various, you know, fairy tales told from the other perspective. Some of them are apparently very bad. I can't speak to it since I haven't watched them. This does a really good job. Like, it, it is a very, very strong exploration of her character. And yeah, the the characterization is is quite good. The you know some of the characters are shown in tremendously varied circumstances. We see how what they're like when things are going well, how they respond to things going wrong, that kind of thing. And some of the characters have secrets that they're hiding, and so like they're acting. They they have to be convincing in keeping a secret, but also like. It, like if 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 they're just flawless liars, if if there's no hint that they're hiding something, that's just you know it's it's imperceptible to the people they're lying to, but we the audience can tell, you know if without that kind of thing it wouldn't be as interesting. But they do a really great job with that. That brings us to the cinematography, which was handled by Robin Vigen, who has twenty eight TV credits as cinematographer and let's see, 19 feature film yeah cinematography credits and let's see other than this he did Nightbreed for also for hold on just to make sure yeah yeah so, you know, evidently, Clive Barker must have been happy with his work on this, to bring him back for that. The Fly 2, the second Hellraiser movie, Hellbound. So, so yeah, you know, he has some, some experience. I suppose, actually, maybe this was the first horror, but yeah. He, he kept doing more horror after this, and you can understand why. He does a really, really strong job. And, let's see. yeah, so, so the, the movies that he has shot that I've, that I've watched ranked worst to best. I respect all of them as well shot. Parents, Hellraiser 2, and Hellraiser. And let's see. Yeah, so according to IMDb Trivia, in his DVD commentary, Clive Barker explained that filming the movie in an actual house forced him to be creative in his cinematography. There was often only one only room for a single camera, and this explains why many of the shots are from only one angle. In particular, vertical movement was often the only movement available to the camera operators, which explained many of the overhead and zoom shots. Only one room in the house of the attic was shot on a soundstage, but only the effects shots used this attic set. And, yeah, to, to be fair, that does hurt the overall product. And, you know, it's, it's not fair to compare it to movie shot today, but, you know, some better shot horror movies from around the same time include Halloween from Halloween 1978, Aliens and Predator 1. And yeah, but you know, it actually it 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 creates a very unique look because of of this you know the the um what is that phrase? Necessity is the mother of invention and 
yeah, the, the and and there are some really like some of the the overhead shots are really really compelling, and really create an an atmosphere that just yeah. And that brings us to the editing, and it was edited by Tony Randall and Richard Martin, R.I.P. And yeah, so Richard Martin had thirty three credits for editing movies. He also did Nightbreed and the second Hellraiser movie. So, yeah, the, the you know, Clive Barker didn't direct the second Hellraiser movie, but I would have been surprised. Like, if he had been like, do not work with that cinematographer or editor or something, I feel like the studio might have been, for, for at least one, you know, but, yeah. And it, of course, also made sense because there are a lot of similarities between the first two Hellraiser movies. Uh, you know, the the, um, the overall vision is fairly... The, the um, yeah, you know, the, the way that the, some of the central elements of this franchise are looked at really changed with the third movie and onwards, but the first two... You know, yeah, you can tell that they, the the people who made the first two, agreed with each other on what this world is like. And right, he also edited the Mirror Cracked and Sleuth, the original, not the garbage remake. Yeah, and so let's see, right. So, the, the movies he edited, Worst to Best, I Respect All, as well edited, the 1990 Hamlet, The Mirror Cracked, Sleuth, Hellraiser 2, and Hellraiser 1. And, yeah, so Tony Randall directed 10 movies, including Hellraiser 2, so, so he wrote, and so he both directed and edited. That can work really well. You know, for for a very long time, Rob Rodriguez would edit his movies as well as direct and, you know, score, film. Yeah. And he directed five, he has five TV directing credits, including for Power Rangers in space. And... Yeah, he edited 20 movies. Yeah. Let's see. Including Cobra Gator, Dog on Christmas, Dog on Hollywood, and A Dog on... Oh, right. A Dog on Christmas, A Dog on Hollywood, and A Dog on Adventure. And... Yeah, the... I, I really, you know, the, the editing is really great, and this might be the oldest, you know, filmed product that I, I know of that employs Nolan's smooth editing between past and present, as also seen in the excellent movie Martha Marcy May Marlene. It really, like, you know, it's clear what is, in, in this movie, it is clear what is past and present, but it actually like there's a there's a flashback very early on and basically the person who's thinking back on it like wishes that it was now so badly that it does it is essentially presented as if it is happening now you know and that's I, was anyone else doing that at this time? You know, today we're like, oh yeah, again. You know, we've seen it so many. You know, Nolan does really well with it. Don't I'm not criticizing that, but but yeah, you know, by by now we've seen it. You know, it's not really new today. But in 1987, I'm not sure anybody else was because because that you know yeah, if he had gone to film school, they would probably have drilled into his head. Make audiences are stupid. They don't understand anything. 
You have to sit them down and talk them through every single thing. And if you do a flashback, you got to make sure that it's clear what's flashback what's past and what's present you cannot make it you know if you film it the same way and edit it the same way people aren't going to be able to, you know and i've i've literally never encountered i've i've read you know a bunch of reviews and research for this i guess i can very quickly find a let's see yeah so i read 100 reviews on imdb and 143 external reviews so you know, almost 250 reviews, and I watched videos. I have literally not encountered one who didn't understand. Oh, it's a flashback. You know, it's and and just sometimes audiences are ready. Sometimes audiences can do more than people think. And yeah, and one critic put it the you know quick and precise editing, and it's it's very true. And there's no, like, nothing really needed to be trimmed. There's no scene that that like, yeah, they did they did such a good job. I've, I've I understand why some people say that some of it feels repetitive and there's not as much variety as they would like, but they do really do a strong a, a very good job of of keeping it moving keeping the the various situations evolving and developing very nicely for sure there are things in this movie that you will see more than once but if you actually pay close attention you'll notice that it's not just the same exact thing like people will react different when something happens more than once and just the yeah like it it really does get across how and and again like if this was one of those just you know mercenary direction di directing duties of the the 80s you know again like i've watched a lot of slash movies some of them it's just like which is which does not mean that i agree that this movie is a slasher but just as a comparison a lot of th those movies, it's just like, okay, well, uh, slasher movies, so you gotta have teenagers, nudity, uh, d uh, drugs, alcohol, and, and a lot of death. You know, okay, we, we can do that. You know, and there's no, there's not really any passion or, like, viewpoint or vision there. It's just, you know, this will put asses in seats. I have kids to feed you know that that kind of thing and with this like you really do get a sense like some of the characters in this we don't spend very much time on but i still feel like i know them and understand them better than ones that we do spend a lot of time on in in other movies and yeah so the budget for this was one million, which helps explain why they ran out near the the end, and and that's also like obviously you you know it's best if they get everything done before they run out of money, but and and there is like there's something in the movie that you you know even if you didn't know that that was after they ran out of money, you might have been able to guess, but yeah, they they put all of it you know one million dollars all of it on screen and the box office was 14.6 million so yeah I think that the the studio was like I don't know I guess we could try a sequel you know no they were they were jumping out of their seats one 14 times the budget made back yeah yeah sequel make it immediately you know, and yeah, it's, it's, I get that, you know, one million, that's not nothing, but it's really great when, when someone gets a chance, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, overall, I would definitely say the, the 1978 movie Halloween is better than this, but it does help a lot that that was not John Carpenter's first rodeo, you know, he had made a bunch of shorts I think it was his third theatrical movie, but 
yeah, he knew what he was doing. And they only had 300,000 and as sev 17 days to shoot. And the film grossed 47 million because it was exactly the kind of thing that, yeah, in 2008 takings, that would be the equivalent of 150 million. So, you know, yeah, enough money to make a Marvel movie. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's one of the most successful independent films of all time, you know. Yeah, it's it's really great when, when someone with passion and an idea get even a you know, even just a few hundred thou, which I realize is a lot of money. Yeah, that can really lead to incredible results. And let's see the that brings. Yeah, so I'm not going to give away who the the antagonist is or are, I will just say incredible, very, very, um, extremely memorable, and you, you know, by the end of this movie, you might just hope to see them return, and I'm not going to give away in, at least not in this part of the, maybe in the thoughts I will talk about if they return, but yeah. And, and and the relationship with the protagonist is also quite compelling. So, this was scored by Christopher Young, who has 99 credits to his name, including one from this year and one that is listed as post-production. And he has done other horror, including the 2019 Pet Cemetery. Deliver Us From Evil, Sinister, Drag Me to Hell, the Uninvited, the, the remake of Uninvited Untraceable, Grudge 2, I think it's the American one, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, yeah, a, a bunch of others. This, I, was this the first horror movie? Oh wait, yeah, he also scored... Freddy's Revenge, Nightmare on Elm Street 2, which is also excellent and also has a very strong score, from, from what I recall, I have to admit. I guess it's been like a year or maybe more since I last watched it, but yeah, I remember this being really, really good. And he also scored the second Hellraiser, so yeah. And yeah, it's, it's haunting operatic with a definite religious tint to it. If Hellraiser was a religion and not a movie franchise, it would use some of this score for its rituals. And I, I love when they do that. I, I really think that is a... I, I get it. I get why a number of movies choose to basically score the movie as if the, the composer is experiencing the movie for the first time. You know, of... Um, an audience member, you know, the, oh, wow, there's, you know, so I, I get that, and sometimes that works extremely well, but I do think, you know, there, yeah, they, you see it in this with the religious theme, you see it in the original Terminator with how, you know, yeah, it's not a spoiler, that, that involves a killing machine, and James Cameron specifically wanted the score to focus on this is a machine so it should part of the score sounds like a metallic heartbeat and it just it it works incredibly well you know i i uh, another example if i recall correctly uh, yeah i think yeah basically everything in the first starship troopers movie is made as if that movie is a recruit you know a uh, recruiting effort you know like uh, you know uh, when when um when the original uh hold on what was it called i know that it stars tom cruise and they recently made a new one uh top gun that's it when the when the original Top Gun came out, 
it led to a bunch of Americans joining the, I want to say, Air Force. I mean, certainly that makes sense since the movie's about the Air Force. The first Starship Troopers movie is basically made as if, you know, it's it's not set in our world. It's set in a, in a different world. You know, it, you know, human world, yes, but it's like maybe very far into the future or something. You know, it, it doesn't quite look like our world or sound like our world. But the movie is made as if it is hoping that we'll end up signing up for the military by the end of watching it. And yeah, the music is one of those, that, you know, instead of presenting it as if the movie is for the actual audience, you know, yeah, it, it acts like it is a, a military recruitment ad. And that's just, I, I love when movies do that. I, I yeah, and and in this, like, if, if, you, if you sit and really pay close attention to the score, you know, yeah, it gets this religious, you know, aspect across in the music, and just, yeah, the movie is much, much better for it. And, yeah, a couple of critic quotes. Bombastic, classical, and creepy score. One thing I have to quickly mention is the music in Hellraiser. I love it. It's dark, gothic, and powerful, and you just don't hear anything like it these days. Everything, Every time something sinister happens, it hits, and it just fits so perfectly. And... Um, right, so, yeah, so a couple of, going into the pacing, a couple of critic quotes before I, yeah. Takes too long to get going. By the time it did, I was zoned out. Too long and the middle is too slow and samey. Now, yeah, I, I completely disagree with those, but I acknowledge that is a lot, you know, a lot of people feel that way about it, especially if they watched it more recently. You know, 1987, no one knew what hit, well, I'll get into, you know, some people maybe, you know, really, really vibed with it and were like, wow, that's exactly what I, you know, but a lot, you know, the mainstream didn't know what hit him at all. And, yeah, you know, part of the, the thing with the pacing is this is, you know, first-time feature director, which is, you know, I mean, I'm just glad he didn't go the, the Rob Rodriguez route and just stitch together a bunch of short films. It's, it's kind of amazing that El Mariachi isn't way more of a mess considering it's stitched together from a bunch of short films, but, yeah. You know, he, he talked about on the commentary track, he didn't know how to direct an entire movie, but he knew how to direct shorts, so if he directed enough shorts, and, you know, there is an overarching plot, but, yeah, it's a series of shorts. But, but yeah, the, the you know, yeah, it's a, it's a, I think he had written novels by the time he, he did this. He wasn't only writing shorts, which, you know, it's it's not that one is necessarily easier than the other, it's that... If you always do short stories and then you have to do something that's longer, you know, do you, you know, how are you going to, how are you going to do that? But no, for, for this, it really is, yeah, you can, you can tell that he, he didn't have a lot of experience with it. I think people today expect movies to move what I would call too fast. And there is this expectation that the story will go through a lot of changes over the course of it. Some people disliked that this movie didn't do that. I thought it was justified by the story and themes, but, you know, your mileage may vary. I, I do think this is one, you know, again, like, if you just sit down and watch an 80s horror movie and you don't know that there's going to be, like, a lot there, you know, it was the same thing when I, I saw a lot of, you know, last week I reviewed Videodrome. Also, one of my favorite horror movies, and for both of these movies, you know, you read a bunch of reviews of people who just, you know, they were just like, I don't know, I have 90 minutes to kill, I hear good things about this one, ooh, I like 80s horror movies, and then they put it on, and they're like, that wasn't what I expected at all. And, yeah, 
you know, because because yeah, you know, if you if you just grab a random '80s horror movie, you know, yeah, you maybe you end up with a Friday the Thirteenth or a Nightmare on Elm Street, which are fun but not particularly substantial, you know. And I say that I I do I enjoy every Friday the Thirteenth movie, yes, even the remake, and I the uh, ultimately I would say the only bad. Nightmare on Elm Street movies are the remake and the sixth movie, uh, Freddy, Freddy's Dead, I think it's called. Other than that, you know, now whether I prefer, you know, the the two that Wes Craven directed or whether I prefer two, three, four, that kind of, you know, it, it go, I keep going back and forth. I can't give it, to, but yeah, I enjoy those, but there's nowhere, and and I would say the seventh one does have a bit more. You know, the meta aspect allows it to get into a little more weighty subjects. But yeah, you know, this and Videodrome are just, you know, the, the mainstream did not expect it at all. And, you know, Videodrome lost a bunch of money because it was, it wasn't, it wasn't just what the mainstream didn't expect. It was also something the mainstream didn't really want, didn't really enjoy. This was a movie that the mainstream did really get into, you know. But but yeah, if you sit down and watch it for the first time today, and you don't know to expect there to be more there. Like, the first time I watched this, I was a teenager. I There was a lot I didn't understand about the movie. But I could see, wow, there's really something here. You know, it's making me feel things. It's not just a bunch of, you know, blood and guts. Which, you know, yeah, I was a teenager in the 90s, so... 80s and 90s horror movies were what I tended to watch, and a lot of them, it is just, you know, I mean, I mean, I get it. It's it's like with, you know, when 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 movies could be more direct about sex, they had a lot of sex in them because people had repressed that part for so long, and yeah, when people started being able to get, you know, a lot of violence and blood and gore in movies. Again, so repressed for so long, yeah, people really wanted that. And, yeah, the movie is an hour and 26 and a half minutes long without end credits, and there's nothing at the end of the end credits. The, the music is good during the end credits, so, you know, but, yeah, even if you sit and stay through the end credits, it's 90 minutes, you know, that's it. And just, it's, it's amazing how much, like, the movie makes me feel so many extreme and different emotions like I've, I've watched three-hour movies that are well respected that don't make me feel things as strongly as this does now that brings us so yeah I would say the best element of this movie is probably the mix of the appealing and disgusting, which is something Barker himself says is part of what he wanted to do in the DVD behind-the-scenes interview. And the worst aspect is probably some of the behavior by characters is odd to the point where it distracts. And, yeah, you know, when I read other negative reviews, you know, I already mentioned some people thought it was boring, other people thought it goes too far. I respectfully disagree. I, I acknowledge that it definitely goes very far, and it was not what people expected at the time, but it, it does not go too far, in my opinion. But I acknowledge it gets close. I, I feel like it goes right up against the line of crossing into just bad taste and just repulsive and just that it goes right up against the line it maybe teases that it's gonna cross the line and then it pulls back so before my first viewing I was worried that it would be very badly dated but the movie exceeded my expectations and yeah I was most looking forward to seeing what all the fuss was about how it led to so many sequels you know like, like I said it was when I first watched it, it was in the, I'm guessing, early 2000s, and, you know, by the time that I first watched it, let's see, yeah, there were like 
five, six movies total. So it was like, okay, there's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, I've watched amazing movies from the 80s that don't have sequels, or at least not very many. So, yeah. The trailer does not, it, it, I would argue it does give at least a little bit too much away, but not very much. I'm very impressed by it. I, I think they did a really strong, like, if you, you know, I would maybe still not recommend you watch it if you haven't already watched the movie, but if you have watched the movie, you know, watch it and think of how, like, it really keeps it just vague enough that just, yeah. And I don't think they could really have gotten audience interest without spoiling anything. And, you know, in, I would definitely say in some ways, the trailer, you know, if you really like the trailer, you'll, you'll like the movie. Although some of the things that the trailer, the, the, yeah, there are things that appear in the trailer that you might not think they, you might not love the handling of them in the movie. Arguably, the cover and poster give away too much, but I don't think, I, I, I'm not sure I can think of any visual for this movie, for this story, that doesn't give too much away. I, I really don't know that, I guess maybe the, the, like, one of the first things you see is this guy surrounded by candles, and, you know, there's this, almost ritualistic feel to it but I mean if you just have that image that doesn't really give you a strong enough idea of what the movie is about and the yeah now right so yeah on here on YouTube I found five clips to, only the one trailer Four music videos, all fan ones, of course. 38 review slash analysis videos, one documentary, seven reactions, three joke slash pop culture ones. Now, on Rotten Tomatoes, this has 70% on the tomato meter based on 53 reviews. 37 of, 37 of them fresh and a 73% audience score based on over 50,000 ratings. Now, the average critic rating was 6.50 out of 10, and 3.8 out of 5 for the audiences. And, yeah, so the, the movie is fresh. And the consensus is elevated by writer-director Clive Barker's fiendishly unique vision. Hellraiser offers a disquieting and sadistically smart alternative to mindless gore. Now, on Metacritic, it has a 56 out of 100 based on 17 critic reviews. And, let's see, the, yeah, the audience score is 8.5 out of 10 based on 219 ratings. So, I'm just really quickly going to look up the... Yeah, so the, the 17 ratings, 10 of them are positive, 4 are mixed, and 3 are negative. And of the user reviews, 186 of the 226 are positive, 20 mixed, 20 negative. And on IMDb, it has 6.9 out of 10, based on... 123,112 IMDb users. Right, and before I get into that, there are 500 IMDb user reviews and 398 without spoilers. I read the top voted 100, including spoiler ones, since I already watched the movie. And yeah, so the, the 100 voted most useful. Let's see. Yeah, so. 1 gave it 1 out of 10, 0 gave it 2 out of 10, 1 gave it 3 out of 10, 0 gave it 4 out of 10, 0 gave it 5 out of 10, 1 gave it 6 out of 10, 6 gave it 7 out of 10, 30 gave it 8 out of 10, 29 gave it 9 out of 10, and 39 gave it 10 out of 10. So, yeah. And, yeah, the, the ratings break down 29.1% gave it 7, 
20.9% gave it 8. 15.8 gave it 6. 10.5 gave it 10. 9.1 gave it 9. 7.1 gave it 5. 3.3 gave it 4. And the rest are below 2%. And let's see, it um, it was nominated for Award of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films, say 2010. And Saturn Award, it was also nominated, uh, hmm, I can't tell if those are both nominees, I guess. Yeah, Saturn Award for Best DVD Collection for the first three movies and it was nominated Saturn Award Best Horror Film, Best Music and Best Makeup. It won the Fear Section Award on the Avarias Fantastic Film Festival in 1988 and the and it also won the Fantasporto 1988 Critics Award and was nominated for the International Fantasy Film Award Best Film and it was nominated Okay, I'm going to try to pronounce Sit Jess Catalonian International Film Festival in 1978. Best film, Clive Barker. That brings us to the special effects. So, the special effects are not only good for their time, they also hold up really, really well. And, you know, I'm not new to 80s special effects. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite a big fan of the output throughout the 80s of David Cronenberg and John Carpenter so you know yeah I'm I'm I have a very high standard for effects and I think yeah I definitely watched some John Carpenter especially the thing before watching this so yeah and these are still some these are some of the best effects of the decade honestly of all time they've aged really well almost all of it holds up to scrutiny there's a little bit near the end that doesn't, but I and those I've shown it to barely remember those. We just remember all the amazing ones. You know, in some ways it is better than those of The Thing 1982, The Fly 1986, and Videodrome. And just, yeah, the, the just incredible makeup, including prosthetics and gore and just, yeah, it's, it's, it's tremendously impressive. Now, I will briefly quote a critic that I, I disagree with, and I think it's worth, I'm, I'm just, I'm, yeah, I'm going to bring up his argument and then counter with my own. Considering Hellraiser was Barker's first time directing a film, he did a pretty solid job. I only really had two issues with the whole film. The first was that the violence and gore is quite frequent and brightly lit, and I can't help but feel that if he implied instead of showing, the film might have achieved a truly terrifying atmosphere. The thing is, Barker's writing is known for his long graphic descriptions, but I don't think it works to always just translate them direct to screen. The mediums are very different and need handling in different ways. Now, for sure, the mediums are different, and, you know, a lot of the time I would uh, agree, but overall, I respectfully disagree. I realize some viewers will agree, so I want to include it. It is true that seeing them so well means it's less about atmosphere, more about them being shocking. I think this works for the film. I, I suppose, I mean, I mean, I think it's it's worth remembering that the original version that, like, if you think about like old movies, like they they only, you know, the the camera doesn't hold on the same effect for very long, or they'll like you know maybe they'll cut to a reaction shot and that kind of thing. The reason for that was that they couldn't make them like um, they couldn't make them completely convincing, and maybe not work. But, you know, they couldn't move between different phases of the... And, and that is some true here. There are effects in this movie where they have to cut to something else, but it works really well. And it does also work really well in some of those classic horror movies. But, you know, I, I saw one person say that in this movie, you know, he's basically, he's practically daring the audience. No, go ahead. See if you can find... See, see if you can figure out how we did this effect, you know, and yeah, I think that's very true. It, it is, 
I, I, the thing is that when this movie shows something, you know, and it's brightly lit and you can get a really good close look at something, it's because it is that way for the characters who are experiencing it. And, yeah, you know, the... the I, I agree that a lot of the time it works better to not show, not not give a like really clear view of the of the effect. But yeah, the the um, what's the word? I I think it works really well here, and it does like it really feels like you are right there instead of being this thing of you know. If something's in the dark, then you, you know, your mind is working really hard to piece together, you know, what, what does the full thing look like, and, you know, th th these kinds of things. And, yeah, that works well for when you're watching a movie and it's building dread, but, you know, in this, the, the characters are seeing these, the, the things that, you know, are scary. They can get a good look at them. And so it makes sense that we can as well. Now, there's some really great stunt work. And, you know, some of it is very unexpected, but works incredibly well. And, let's see. Yeah, I'm not going to get into exactly the details, but I will say... You know, I agree that there is a lot of violence and gore in this movie. I don't think it's too much. And the, the sexual material, also some of it also goes far, but I don't think it's excessive. And let's see. Yeah, this is one, you know, a lot of the time I will recommend reading the review by Roger Ebert, R.I.P., on this particular case, you know, he. I think he was he was, a lot of the time, really really good, of a reviewer. As others have noted, when it comes to horror movies, like, a bunch of the time he just didn't really, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. So. I only have the very basic DVD. It has 10 minutes of behind the scenes, including interviews and B-roll. You know, it's it's good. Um, it's not, like, amazing. And the... Does not also have the trailer? I guess maybe not. No, that's right. The trailer I found on here on YouTube. Anyway, you can stream this depending on the country, on you know, Pluto TV, Prime... And, you know, yeah, sometimes when it comes to streaming, the question is to be or not to be. And in this case, yeah, the movie's on to be. Yeah, I guess if I have to be 100% like objective, I can't quite give this higher than a 7 out of 10, but this is my video. I rate this 8 Mysterious Secrets in the House out of 10. And. I, let's see, last time I watched it was like two weeks ago or something like that. I could watch it later today. I love this movie. You can you can watch it over and over and just, yeah. And, yeah, so. Worst to best of, oh, right, yeah. The, uh, let's see, yeah, I've already talked about how it holds up. I think... It is a movie that in some ways has actually become more relevant. I think Clive Barker understood something that a lot of people weren't quite ready to admit, you know, psychologically, and because of that, the movie's actually more relevant. You know, I... I maybe not as much today, but it has, like... The, the ideas in it started to become more mainstream after it came out, you know, and that is sometimes that's some of the best horror, you know, is when you have something that 
the mainstream is maybe basically equipped to comprehend, at least on a, on a gut level, but not actively discussing yet. You know, the, the, the scariest is the stuff that's just out of reach. It's still just in the darkness. You can't quite make out the, the full, you know, where, you know, because when something's in the dark, it's like, is that, okay, is that a, is that a cat or is it a lion? You know, I can just, I can hear something like making cat noises and I don't, I don't know yet it, which it is. And, you know, once, once it runs out and it's just a cat, it's like, oh, okay, I guess we don't need to make entire feature-length movies about if it's just a cat, but as long as it's still just, you know, possibly a lion, that's, that's the sweet spot. So, worst to best, all I've seen of the Hellraiser series. Hellseeker, Inferno, Hellbound, and 1987 original. So, that is it for the the review itself so from now on there be spoilers and yeah the rest of the video is not a review it's a series of well thoughts some of it is analysis some of it's MST3, mst3k riff tracks and other jokes and yeah the time codes for all the sections are in the description box so I'm starting with thoughts that I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting of a like, and the section after that is thoughts that I had before watching. So gonna note the time code, and then we dive into notes taken while watching. So I'm not the first to point it out, but it really is great that there is this church bell playing before Frank solves the puzzle, fitting with the religious theme for the Cenobites. And his skin pierced by hooks in close-up does sadly look a lot like latex, which is what it almost definitely was. One of the only effects to not quite hold up. And we see they didn't just kill Frank, which again, you know, I mean, 1980s if you want to see someone be killed on camera you know I mean not not snuff film but someone fake killed in a movie yeah you know like I mean just like you know get a get a bunch of random horror movies you know stick your hand and pick one at random it almost definitely has at least one person you know dying in in some way you know very often on screen so, you know, if, if that was all we got here, it would be like, eh, seen that before, but no, 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 they didn't just kill him, they pulled him apart with hooks, carefully hanged up his organs on rotating pillars, and then assemble his face, which is now detached from the skull, like some sort of perverse puzzle. And even before you see Larry and Julia, you get a sense they're not that happy of a couple. You know, you hear them speaking through the, the door, and, you know, he's struggling to find the key, and, the, yeah. And Julia's sad when Larry mentions that Frank is probably in jail. What she wants to do, the things that she wants to do with him, she's not going to get to do, even on a conjugal visit, which, obviously, she could not get because they're not married. And she's even sadder when Larry mentions that Kirsty is going to come by, so, yeah. Very, very clear. This is not the, yeah, not a happy marriage. Clive Barker didn't have to make the kitchen disgusting. Maggots, cockroaches, discarded cigarette butts. That required time and effort, and I'm glad he and the crew put it in. And that was uh, something that, like, the first time I watched it, I didn't even really think about. But, yeah, that's, like, that gets to you, and it's like, ugh, that's disgusting, you know. And it is, like, this thing of just... There are so many horror movies where, you know, I'm, I'm not saying every horror movie should be disgusting. Some of them do a great job at being scary without necessarily being outright disgusting. But this one really manages to disgust you. And I, I get it. Some people are going to be like, yeah, of course, maggots and cockroaches, that's disgusting. But it is just this thing. And, and like, within, let's see. So yeah, you see the the maggots and the and that stuff. It, yeah, yeah. So you have you know Frank. You know I'm not sure if he's naked, but he's definitely bare chested and sweaty and surrounded by candles. Some people are into that, you know. 
and then you have the the really gross body horror and then this disgusting you know the the maggots and cockroaches and not long after you have the flashback to sex which is also intricate you know the the grunting and and the the you know the the hand gets closer and closer to the nail that just you know it does it doesn't just like cut it tears through the flesh and he's bleeding like crazy you know so it's constantly this thing of the disgusting and the the you know beautiful or or sensual some people maybe find too much of the early dialogue to be nothing but exposition I personally think they do a good job of fitting it all in, making it natural. Based on the early scenes, I would have to say that the single least believable thing in this film is definitely that they actually at some point managed to move that goddamn mattress. Frank gradually reforming is just amazing looking, and we see the rats freaking out. Nothing good happens for rats to freak out like that. And, you know, apparently part of what they did was melt wax and then, I, I'm not sure if they filmed it backwards or play it backwards, you know, that's how the heart and brain reform. And that's, yeah, you know, I've, I, I've probably seen something like it in some other movie, but it just is, like, it's, yeah, you know, we've, we've seen, we see bodies change in a lot of movies. But the way that it's handled here and by Cronenberg and John Carpenter, it just, it hits you, you know? And I appreciate it starts with just liquid pumping through the floorboards. In part, it makes it extra gross, but also just, you know, before you have form, you have liquid. You know, it does, there's not form just without anything, yeah. Steve takes the cigarette into his mouth and then back out without using his hands. A very clear oral reference to Kirsty, even though her father, stepmother, and their friends are right there. I have never seen someone drink that much and still be that thirsty. And both of the times that Julia meets Frank, you know, first when he's human in the rain and later when he's starting to regenerate in what the short story and I will refer to as the damp room, he asks her for things before telling her who he is. You know, it's, it's just that little thing of like, because, because like, obviously, you know, she's horrified when she finds that the man she loved has been reduced to this. But imagine like a stranger comes to your door and starts asking to come in or just this this you know human shaped gelatinous blob of like unfinished like you know like we the audience know what happened to him know why he looks like that but if you just look at him yeah I mean it looks like someone just you know tore all the skin from him you know it, it's horrifying for that creature to ask you, to demand things of you, you know, and it's, it's a, I, I appreciate the contrast that when he first shows up, you know, he's like taking up space and he's, you know, you know, go ahead and let me in. Well, do you have a, do you have a towel? You know, he's, he's like, he's not, he's very comfortable with her saying, you know, he knows he's, yeah. I'm not gay. I'm not bi, so I can't speak to it, but I can understand, you know, gay Clive Barker and straight Claire Higgins were very into him. You know, Claire Higgins, it's acting, but nevertheless, you know, the, yeah, and, and then the second time, you know, he prevents her from leaving, but then he retreats somewhat to the shadows, and he says, don't look at me. You know, it's it's this thing of he legitimately, you know, yeah, he's he's alive again. That's that's great, but it really is like, oh no, that's yeah. And let's see. And I appreciate you know this thing of you know, do you have a towel? And then it cuts back to the present. You know, Kirsty asking Julia, do you have a towel? And Kirsty has a nightmare, and the white sheet becomes soaked with blood, and then she sees what appears to be her father, but more resembles Frank wearing Larry's skin, although you only realize that on repeat viewings or in retrospect. 
We do already know that Frank wants some skin on his bones. The DLC he got from Hell did not feature a single skin that he liked. And he ends up going with his brothers, which... Is that a backwards compatibility thing? And we and Julie hate the guy he br that she brings home when he gets aggressive with her, asking if she changed her mind. That's the final push she needed for, to bring him in to kill for Frank. And I appreciate that in addition to dying, he loses teeth from the hammer assault, like some of the lower teeth, if you don't, if it's been a while since you watched. And it looks like she did some damage to his jaw. Like, it's like, you know, open it. You know, I get, okay, maybe some of it's rigor mortis, but like, no, he's, you know, and, and again, it's like, you sit there and you watch her take the hammer to this guy and you're like, you know, you, you can imagine like losing teeth like that. That's horrifying. And I mean, based on the look on his face, I think he felt it. I think she knocked out teeth before she hit him hard enough in the, to, to crack the skull, you know, so, yeah. And yeah, 41 minutes in, Frank mentions the Cenobites after we very briefly see them at the start. I think they have less than one minute combined screen time at the start of the film. So yeah, you know, and they ended up becoming the face of the franchise. And, you know, especially the lead Cenobite. The rat that's been nailed and is still moving was such a convincing effect that they almost got in trouble and had to show, you know, no, 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 look, it's it's just an effect. It's not a real rat. It's a mechanical rat. You know, we didn't actually drive nails through a, a rat. That's, yeah. And it really is, like... It, it looks... The, the movement that it makes looks like a rat that's trying to get out of the situation that, yeah. And there's also that part where you see, like, I mean, that's got to be, like, vomit. And and, there, and the rats are just running over to, to eat from it when when Frank comes back. See, that's the thing. Does that mean Frank vomited after coming back? I mean, I could understand. That probably is a, yeah. Because it wasn't there when she was there earlier, and, and Larry came in bleeding all over the place. Should they maybe have had a line about, like, what's the word? Hemophiliac, I think. So, or, wait. Um, the, the you know, because there is, like, a... Uh, Nope, that is not it. Um, yeah, um, you know, so pe some people bleed more than than others. Yeah, I'm not sure I can pink put my finger on why, but the skinless Frank is somehow nastier looking when he's wearing a shirt or a suit. The blood and other fluids soaking through the material—it's like some perverse game of pretend. You know, it's it's just, yeah. You know, and, and it is, like, I I think that it was the right call. I think if the entire movie just had him naked, like he is at the start, I think we'd eventually get used to it. But it is also, like, it kind of makes us think, does he not yet completely realize? Maybe he's gotten used to it. Like, he's had to live skinless for days now. You know, maybe he doesn't realize how horrifying he looks, you know, and that's... Just kind of, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, and, you know, uh, Kirsty working at the the pet shop, you know, kind of overwhelmed with, with several different people asking for things. And, you know, she, she follows the, um, what do they call that? Um, the, the... Ah, yeah, the, the unhoused individual, you know, and, and, you know, he goes up and he, you know, he starts apparently eating something. And she's like, what are you eating? Crickets. And as she goes to Julia before seeing Skinless Frank, Kirsty is shocked at the noise of the door slamming shut behind her. There's a bit of a theme in this movie with doors closing behind people, you know, the door also slides shut behind Julie the first time she goes into the damp room before Larry bled all over the floor and, you know, being locked in against the real Kirsty and hospital damp room when Julie or Frank are about to kill someone. You've grown. You're beautiful. 
just when you thought Frank couldn't get any more disgusting, he's also into incest. I mean, what can I say? He's a family man, wearing his brother's skin, boning his brother's wife, and soon his brother's daughter. And it's actually super creepy that apparently, like, wait, did Julie hear that? I guess maybe she didn't hear that. But the way that Frank is talking as Larry later, does she maybe just think that's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if, if she's put, she doesn't appear to be put off by it, but I guess maybe she doesn't know. J Julia doesn't know about the incest. Some things have to be endured. That's what makes the pleasure so sweet. Now, some people say that Frank is stupid. He shouldn't reveal to Kirsty how important the box is to him. Think about it. He's been in hell. It's not clear exactly how long, but certainly long enough that the food in the kitchen became filled with maggots. Like, as gross as Frank is, I sincerely doubt that he would not throw out food that he saw was full of maggots. So that must have happened afterwards and the box and the Cenobites could put him back in hell indefinitely. Of course he's not going to be able to play it cool. So, yeah, in this first movie, every time someone solves the box, it is a trial and error process. It's not easy like in some of the sequels. I love the amount of detail on the teeth and eyes of the creature in the hallway. I appreciate that Kirsty manages to say the right things to prompt the Cenobites to explain things to her. Good thing for her for the movie that she isn't one of those people who just can't speak when they're really terrified. You know, she's smart enough to to like try to figure out who they are and then even propose a deal. You know, it, the the chatter comes up and jams his fingers into her mouth and like just yeah, she still manages to you know as soon as and and then you know afterwards. He, he, like, grabs her by the neck and the, the head, and it's like, you know, you know, if he wanted to, he could strangle her, ch you know, or just choke her out. He could, like, uh, what's it called, like, snap her neck, you know, just, it is an inherently violent way that he is engaging with her. There's no, like, and it sort of stands in really stark contrast to how, like, both, Frank as Larry and then and Julia like caress her face when she comes to explain about you know she thinks that Frank is still in the attic and once Frank has his has Larry's skin he shows affection for Julia and it leaves a trace of blood on her face and it's just again this thing like blood is disgusting but the way he touches her face is kind of sensual and they immediately have sex and yeah, the Cenobites let Kirsty out of the locked hospital room. I mean, that's downright nice of them. I guess they must really want Frank back. Even though the female Cenobite says, perhaps we would prefer you. And Julia shows affection towards Larry and even Kirsty, but only after Frank is back. She had sex with him again, and it's Frank posing as Larry. You know, think about all the time, you know, like... You know, Kirsty has has water all over her face, and like you know, she asks Juliet, "Have you got a towel?" And Juliet's just like, "Oh yeah, it's it's in, it's it's in there. Go go through the door." You know, like even as a, like a step parent, it's like, "Oh, are are you okay? You know, what 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 happened? Like, let let me you know, maybe not help dry off. Maybe that's excessive. She you know, she's proud that she got her own room. She doesn't want to live with her father anymore, but." You know, just saying, uh, to get through the door. I have, look, I am trying very hard to focus on a memory of sex, and you come in and, and spoil it. You know, but, but yeah, after, you know, she's like, oh, you know, she's caressing her face and looking really understanding, and so, yeah. When lead Cenobite reveals himself to a now horrified Frank and says, Frank. I would love if they had like an outtake where Frank goes, that's my name, don't wear it out. Considering that the Cenobites deal is eternal pleasure and pain, it does feel very odd how they just behave like regular slasher villains at the end, sneaking up on people trying to stab, you know, the, the, um, ch uh, not chatter, 
Butterball has the, you know, and it's one of the best moments for him. He takes off the glasses, revealing the eyes sewn shut, which I'm almost certain he doesn't do at any other point in this movie. I think he maybe also does in at least one of the sequels. But yeah, you know, and then he's coming at Steve, you know, who's got his back turned and he's going to stab. And it's like, I'm sorry, what does this have to do with eternal pleasure and pain? It's just, it's, it's kind of frustrating that I, I'll talk more about it in the next thought section. And Shatter even bothers to hide under fabric to really spook Kirsty when, you know, he's like, he, he stood there, like, he, he covered his, I, I forget, is it maybe like see through plastic or something? And he's standing there, like, oh, she's gonna, she's gonna scream what I did. Boogie, boogie, boo. You know, it's just like, okay, that's, what, what are you, what are you doing? Maybe they're having an identity crisis. Maybe, maybe getting Frank back wasn't quite as fun as they thought it would be. Steve really wasn't a necessary character for the film at all, but it's a really only here in the climax that he shows just how utterly, extremely useless he is. Like, you know, Steve shows up, and he and Kirsty has to save him from being stabbed by Butterball, and then you know he understands. Oh, there's something about the box, so he like tries to pick it up, and Kirsty like grabs it out of his hand, and like she she doesn't she doesn't say like. A word, but like from her face and her grunt, it's like, "Give me that, you idiot! You don't, you have no idea what you're doing. Let me do it, you know." And I, I'm joking. I obviously I do really like the, you know, a strong woman in a horror movie. You know, like this is a movie where the women are stronger than the men. Like the, the I, I don't think Frank would have been willing to seduce multiple people for for Julia, you know, and then, I'm, uh, I should say, I'm not just talking about, like, physical strength, I'm talking about being willing to do something painful for some, you know, for someone else, you know, he's, he's a hedonist, he only thinks of himself, and he proved that when, you know, he didn't mean to stab Julia, but then he starts, like, you know, he does the thing where he sucks the, the, the yeah, he, he absorbs, I think is the, the pr preferred term. He absorbs her the way that he did to the, the people that she killed for him. And he's like standing there like, nothing personal. And she's like, oh, feels kind of personal though. Just, yeah. But, but yeah, if, you know, Julia and Kirsty are stronger than Larry, Frank, and Steve. And I really appreciate that. You know, if, I mean, if Julia had been, like, a weak, you know, like, think about how easy it would have been for her to be, like, I, yes, I will do anything, and then she gets out the door, psych, I had my fingers crossed, you know, and, like, I mean, I don't know, call the police or something, and just, no movie, you know, but, yeah, and it would be a much poorer movie if that were the, the case. I know the following might sound ridiculous, but I honestly only realized that we don't actually see the skeletal dragon flying away recently. It's it's a POV shot. We only see the skeletal dragon very briefly. It barely moves, but the movie is so effective for years. I thought that I did see it fly. You know, just yeah. And that brings us to the final section. And that is notes taken before watching. So, Doug Bradley portrays the lead Cenobite, and he was later renamed Pinhead, but that's a title that Barker dislikes, preferring Hellpriest. And, you know, apparently Hellpriest was not used before Barker's 2015 novel, The Scarlet Gospels. From here on out, I will be referring to the character as Hellpriest, out of respect for Clive Barker. And I will be referring to the character using he, him pronouns rather than it, since the 2022 film has the character played by a trans woman, and because so many trans people are referred to as it in attempt to other them, so I am not going to play into that at all. I'm 100% on Clyde Barker's side about the name, but for those who might be confused as to why anyone would use the other term, it's because the crew making the movie have to have specific characters ready for specific scenes. If you only see the Hell Priest and not the other Cenobites, 
Very likely Hell Priest was the only one who had their makeup done, which is a process taking hours, so you don't want to be doing that for characters you don't need, and Hell Priest or Lead Cenobite are not as easy to remember for the crew. Many movies with intricate effects also have specific names for the different effects, again, for ease of communication. You know, and, and like, in the short story, that, you know, Hell Priest is not the the one with the you know, originally the lines were supposed to be more or less, was it equally split? Or at least it was supposed to be other characters, you know. Chatterer and Butterball both have lines in the script, but once the makeup was done, like, they couldn't really, like, I, I, part of me wishes that they would do, like, they would just, like, mouth the words since, you know, Parts of this movie are dubbed later anyway, but, I mean, I can understand. It is easier to do a proper reaction to, to a line if it is spoken properly on set, you know. And, yeah, and, you know, well, shouldn't it be Nailhead? Well, originally it was Pins, but the, um, let's see, I think it was that the effects team found that it just looked better with nails instead. And, let's see. Right, and I guess, you know, for some people might not know. The, the Butterball is the, the heavy-looking Cenobite, and Chatterer is the one with the exposed teeth and gums. And, let's see. Yeah, you know what, they, they give really great performances. They don't, you know, several of them don't have lines, but the physical performance really, like, because think about it. They had to sit in the makeup chair for hours waiting for this stuff to get done. And then, you know, they can barely speak. I I don't know if the guy with the sunglasses could, see, you know, if, if Butterball could actually see anything. I Maybe they made the material so that he could look out through it, but it had to make it look like his eyes were sewn shut, which obviously they're not actually going to do. But, yeah, you know, and they're walking, and some of it is, is, like, heavy, they're struggling, some of them may be struggling with their balance, you know, all this stuff. And they still have to look intimidating, because if, if you can tell, that's a dude in makeup, obviously, you know, look at the way he's moving and standing, it doesn't work at all. You know, makeup is only as good as the filming, editing, and acting. And, which is not to take anything away from the incredibly talented makeup team who, as far as I understand, also worked on other really incredible effects, horror movies. But yeah, Nicholas Vince plays the Chattering Cenobite, Simon Bamford plays Butterball Cenobite, Grace Kirby plays Female Cenobite, and Oliver Smith plays Skinless Frank or Frank the Monster. And that's... yeah, I'll, I'll talk more about that. Now, let's see... Yeah, I gotta, I gotta... Okay, so according to IMDb Trivia, according to Clive Barker, as the writing of the Hellraiser script took place during the height of A Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, and Halloween film series, his intended portrayal of Hellpriest as an articulate and intelligent character was initially not well received by the producers. Some suggested he should act more like Freddy Krueger and crack jokes, while others suggested he be a silent character like Jason Voorhees and Michael Myers. To be clear, I, you know, I don't love all of the Freddy Krueger jokes, but I do appreciate, I, you know, there's some... Uh, I guess I can't mention my favorites without spoiling. Uh, in the third movie, there is a, a young character who really likes these um, marionette puppets. If you've watched the movie, you know where I'm going with that. If you haven't, I haven't spoiled anything. That, I think, is great Freddy Krueger. I don't necessarily, you know, yeah, I think he got way too quippy as the movies went along. And I do think it's worth noting, he barely speaks in the first movie, you know. But yeah, the, he does laugh. He, he cackles a, a bunch, but he doesn't really crack, you know, he, yeah, he, he has like just a few quips, but yeah. 
I do like when they don't go too far with the Freddy Krueger, you know, quipping. And I quite like Jason Voorhees and, you know, in... In the 1978 movie and in the H40 trilogy, I love Michael Myers. Not taking anything away from those. That is definitely not how Hell Priest should be. I, I love that Hell Priest is so different from those. Like, yeah, I mean, Hell Priest in this one movie, you know... Yeah, like, it, I, I think he might say more than... I, th I think it took Freddy Krueger several movies to have as many lines as Hell Priest does here, even though Freddy Krueger has, you know, significantly more screen time, and he does, you know, he is a more, yeah, a chattier character than some of the others, but, yeah, especially compared to Jason and Michael. Barker insisted that Hell Priest's personality be more evocative of Christopher Lee's portrayal of Count Dracula. Part of the tr chill of Dracula surely lies in the fact that he's very clearly and articulately aware of what he's doing. You feel that this is a penetrating intelligence, and I don't find dumb things terribly scary. I find intelligence scary, particularly twist intelligence. It's one of the reasons why Hannibal Lecter is scary, isn't it? It's because you always feel that he's going to be three jumps ahead of you, and I 100% agree, and it is like... Because at the end of the day, like, Michael and Jason, I mean, do they even really understand the full... Like, they just, they go around and they kill. They they like killing. But do they even really appreciate... You know, Freddy appreciates. Freddy understands how much pain he's causing. And he understands that when he's once he kills someone, they don't come back. You know, and I do think one of the scary things about Michael, especially in 1978, is that, you know, it is like, does he even quite understand that when he kills someone they're they're dead it's it's almost like a child a small child playing you know like you know oh if i if i throw a thing then it's over there then i don't have it anymore if i stab someone they die and then they're not alive you know and that is you know it's scary in a different way but hell priest he knows 100% what he's doing he knows and and he he puts words to it you know, he, he specifically, like, just a line like, you know, she, Kirsty asks, I forget if it's who are you or what are you, and he responds, purveyors of extreme pleasure and pain, angels to some, demons to others. He's not confused, he's not in denial, he knows exactly what he's doing what it feels like he knows that you don't come back when he takes you to hell and he and there's absolutely no sense of remorse there's no indication that he feels like he he doesn't stop for you know when they realize that Kirsty didn't mean to solve the box like they barely even really hesitate that you know like you know she says you know i can get you frank cotton and Without skipping a beat, the female Cenobite is like, perhaps we prefer you. I realize I'm I'm not I'm not doing the voices. I can't do the voices justice, so why even bother? And yeah, so a couple of critic quotes. So uh, the reason that Frank makes noise right before Larry finds the rats, Frank nailed. Or uh, right, yeah. He doesn't actually find them. We see them, but he just let's see, he yeah, he thought there were... He realized there was at least one rat, but he doesn't see the dead ones. Anyway. You know, yeah, the reason that Frank makes that noise is he hates not being in control, relying on Julia, and she's the one who has to deal with him, you know, with, with the, his noise. And for Julia, it's like Frank is her child. She has to feed him, take care of him. And... Let's see... Yeah, the Cenobites administer intense forms of S&M, pleasure derived from pain, and vice versa. Hellraiser seems inspired more by the Italian horror masters, Dario Argento, Suspiria, Mario Bava, Black Sunday, and Lucio Fulci, 
the beyond than by any American horror films. That it takes place within a family unit, not just a group of teenagers in the woods, gives it an extra layer of meaning, not to mention blood ties. The movie lays on symbols of family and marital relations, such as the scene in which the good brother cuts his hand, thus spilling the blood that Uncle Frank needs, while hauling his marital bed up the stairs. Julie, and you know, others have pointed out, Julie is in an abusive relationship with Frank. There's the theme of addiction, and some point, some critics point out, when we see Larry watching the boxing match, he is clearly getting into it. He's enjoying it. He's not just like, you know, oh, pff, I don't know, nothing else is on. No, he's into it. You know, he even he he pauses and he's like, are you sure you're okay with it? I mean, we can change the channel if you know. And he can barely get those words out without getting it. We can watch something. You know, it's just, and it's, even he feels some drive towards violence. Now, he doesn't commit violence himself, but he likes seeing real violence carried out by others. And I think it's very noteworthy, they're not watching a horror movie, they're watching a boxing match. This is real violence. He's, you know, he didn't decide to sit down and just watch an 80s horror movie he decided to sit down and and I think it's like live too isn't it so like for all he knows someone's about to like take serious damn don't have people died in the boxing ring or is that only in movies I'm, I'm not entirely sure but like you know for all he knows he's about to watch someone be like severely like you know take some serious damage and that doesn't put him off that might actually be part of why he likes watching it you know Kirsty is a lot like a final girl from a Jason or Freddy flick. You could easily write the Cenobites out of the story. And they're they're essentially there for lore, you know. And I you know I forget if I found some who said I think yeah, there were some reviewers who said that that's a weakness, some said that it's a strength. I consider it strength. Essentially, this is the story of Julia and Frank, you know, and the other characters are, yeah, you know, I mean, essentially, you could have made it that there aren't, you know, the Cenobites don't appear, but when you solve the puzzle box, it opens a door and, you know, tries to drag in anyone that opened the box and or that have been dragged in before. So, a couple of things from the short story. Frank wanted kinky sex with virgins, who he somehow expects to be experts at sex. And the Cenobites specifically ask him what he wants. They don't immediately start torturing him. It's only when he says he wants kinky sex that they do anything to him at all. And they specifically warn him, if they take him to their dimension, he can't return. But they say that the feeling, sensory, will be stronger than in this world, where he has sex and is disappointed with it. Honestly, I think the movie would be stronger if this was in it. And I think it's it might be a censor thing. Like, the, the censors might have been upset at the idea that a regular human being would intentionally choose to go to hell. You know, because that is a very provocative idea in, you know, England, in America... You know, where there are so many Christians, I forget if it's still majority Christian, but yeah, you know, the the notion of, of hell, and that is part of what Clive Barker is doing. He's poking at, well, you know, we, like, let's be honest, a lot of human beings want a lot of pleasure, and if pleasure can be derived from pain, could hell simultaneously, or perhaps, um... Uh, maybe not simultaneously, but on and off kind of thing, be the source of not only extreme pain, eternal pain, but extreme pleasure, eternal pleasure, you know, and it is, yeah. And, you know, before the physical torture with hooks, they overwhelm his senses, all five of them, some of it with memories. And, you know, he feels such extreme arousal that he masturbates onto the floorboards, not for pleasure, but just to stop the feeling of arousal. And the, you know, the the sperm on the floor interacts with his brother's blood. That's how he comes back in the short story. 
And yeah, like today you might be able to get away with that, but in 1987, I'm not sure he even ran that across the the censors, or they, or he was just like, okay, they're not gonna let me have a guy come on the floor in the movie. That's not gonna be hooks into flesh being torn apart, going to hell. Sure, I mean, some of that is like just Bible stuff, and they have that in schools. They teach that to children. But this, you know, sex, ugh, they're going to freak out over that. And after a while, with this experience, he leaves for hell with a Cenobite. It's not clear how long passes between Frank going to hell and then, you know, Larry going in. But a church with a working bell was built in the meantime. And I love that the story doesn't really draw attention to this there's just the when when frank is toying with the box he feels like he hears a church bell and he thinks to himself that's ridiculous there is no church anywhere near here you know and then when larry and um julia you know start to move in you know it notes that ah the you know the the church bell told uh a was maybe noon or something. I forget exactly, but just you know, it it just if if you're paying close attention, you you notice. Oh, now there's a church bell, and that kind of tells you because that that's not like one day to the other. That's that's a yeah, and yeah. In in the short story, Kirsty is a friend of Larry's and is actually you know kind of attracted to him, but. I think he doesn't know that. I, I, yeah, something like that. And yeah, it is kind of like, if I recall, it is in the short story too that you know they they go eating in this Chinese restaurant, and Larry asks, "Can you talk to my wife?" And it is like, when he changed that to the daughter, it does become a little creepy that the, you know, this guy is asking his own daughter who's old enough to know about sex, can you please help me with my wife who's, you know, because in the, let's see, I think in the short story he specifically says, I think, you know, or, or is it just implied? But but yeah, I, I'm i almost certain in the short story, at before his death, he does legitimately feel like maybe she's cheating on me. You know, he doesn't have any idea about Frank and that whole thing, but yeah. So in the short story, his name is Rory, I'll just continue to refer to him as Larry to avoid confusion. And, you know, there's a part of the short story where Julia hates sex with Larry and imagines Frank in his place. You know, for a, for a gay man, Clive Barker really understood female sexuality. It's, yeah, and, and uh, I forget if I ended up putting that into my notes, but apparently he was... Um, he was a sex worker for some time, and yeah, you know, a number of the clients were women. Actually, was it maybe all of them since, you know, homosexuality wasn't that, uh, you know, accepted back then, so it might have been, yeah, possibly. And yeah, he came to understand, you know, female sexuality through that and applied that to, you know, this, and yeah. And it's it's wild that yeah I I think I wrote that somewhere else in my notes I'll get to it anyway and uh, yeah Frank gets the the box in Dusseldorf where he smuggled heroin in I as much as I do not like you know I've, uh, let's see I think it was someone did a video called Everything Wrong with Hellraiser and they sinned the movie for the Asian man at the start with the note. Unambiguous, uh, ambiguously Asian man is am unambiguously racist, and yeah, it is. I really wish that that that's one of the only things that I would really just remove from the movie. But I get it, you know. It is this, it's the it's Orientalism basically. But I do, yeah. It is like just finding it in Dusseldorf that is not as as interesting. I gotta say. And the Cenobites have a different idea of pleasure from Frank. Maybe they don't fully understand human pleasure at all. He asked for mercy, was given none over weeks and months. And Julia didn't want to know 
the men she killed. She felt it was easy to kill the first one. She uses a knife, not a hammer. I gotta say, I am really happy with this change. It's not that we hadn't seen someone use a hammer to kill a person by 1987. I'm almost certain that was in at least one of the Jason movies by then. But the f just the the um, you know up, it, either way you can imagine. Actually, I think ah crap, I forget if Julia is fine with that first murder. I I ah uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate that in in the movie. It takes, you know, yeah. Anyway, yeah, so the, the, um, yeah, you know, just, it's, it's so, it's so brutal in a way that we hadn't really seen, like, yeah, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure by 1987 we had seen a woman stab someone else and just seeing, seeing the, the, you know, and also, like, the you know uh, Claire Higgins in in the interview behind the scenes thing on the DVD says you know I think women will probably empathize but men might check their tool sheds you know and yeah it is this thing like you know she's she's doing it in his house she's having sex with his brother she's using his tools you know I mean if if she used a knife to stab like a lot of people would say well you know kitchen stuff that's for the woman but she's specifically using this more you know it takes strength to kill someone with a hammer where okay it also does with a with a knife but like you can't do it if if you're using a hammer you have to use strength where like essentially if you're using a knife like if you can like i don't know trip them so they land on the knife that can do a lot of you know, for but if you trip them and they land on a hammer, that's that's much more difficult to get. You know, but yeah, she like she smacks him several times in the head with this hammer and just yeah, and it actually takes much longer for her to kill him, which I think he might have been hoping that he would be able to. They did cut down at least some of the hammer, hammerhead stuff. And the absorbing of the body by Frank is much more graphic. When Cinnabite explains to Kirsty that basically the rules say that if you open the box without meaning to, you have to go to the hell dimension. And Julia speaks after Frank kills her, her head in the lap of the corpse, the engineer. And the engineer bumps into Kirsty if they leave the house to put the box into the hands of Kirsty. And that was how it was supposed to spread the, you know, yeah. The, the box needs a keeper or so, something like that. And I I gotta say, I completely forget who the engineer... Um, I guess I can just... I won't spend long on this, but the... Um, let's see, if I find the original... Okay, Hellbound Heart Engineer. Um, let's see. Hmm. Okay, I guess it does. Oh, hold on. Here we go. The engineer, engineer. unseen leaner of the order of the gash. Oh, that's right. Appears only as flashes of light. Some minute explaining living and dead people alike as conduits of its will. When these people, the engineer, possess our illusions or exist, remains unknown. The first conduit was the then dead Julia of severed head. Was able to speak which the book draws special attention to describing as impossible. Bereft of lungs, how could it speak? It spoke, nevertheless. And, oh, that's right, in the film, the engineer's the demon that, um, in, in, the, in the hallway, the corridor. Yeah. And, let's see. Anyway, yeah. So, yeah, like I said, you know, it's definitely worth reading the, the short story. There were some things, you know, yeah, the, the engineer could not quite, I think they could do it justice today. Maybe, I guess maybe it's in the 2022, certainly it seems like they have a lot of respect for the, the lore and want to get back to basics, want to get away from the sequels. But yeah, the... the I don't think you could have done it 
completely convincingly 1987 and maybe that was also some yeah I can imagine like once he started talking to effects people and they read the description of the engineer and they were like I don't think so dude no let's let's see if we can think of something else you know I forget if it does describe I, th I think at least some of the some of the ones that we get in the in the actual movie are described in the the short story so as you can maybe tell from my choices the spooktober fresh video drama this i think by far some of the greatest horror can come from human nature rather than inhuman monsters so right from the start there has been a lot of lgbtq aspects in this franchise yes i know some people would say i should just use the q word i am not comfortable doing that so i continue to use the the uh, yeah, say LGBTQ. The short story was written by Clive Barker, a gay man who had some experiences with... Th that's right, yeah. Experiences with female sexuality based on his stint as a sex worker, which I absolutely respect. Sex work is work. Who also wrote and directed the first movie, and he based the Cenobites with all their leather piercings and such on an SM s and night in a gay nightclub he went to. Now, today, s and is not exclusively seen as gay, but in 1987, it most definitely was. And that's, you know, that's part of the whole... That's part of why I said the mainstream was not really ready for it. But, you know, people who were, you know, yeah, a lot of the, the LGBTQ people who were into S&M at the time, you know, they, I mean, I can, I figure the movie was probably, st pro probably pushed uh, the S&M past what they were, what they would want done to their bodies, but they could appreciate, oh, that's what he's going off, you know. And, again... I shouldn't have to say the following, but for some people, obviously, you're allowed to love this franchise if you're straight and cis. I am, and I love the first movie, and I respect the second movie, and I don't even remember. Fifth and sixth movies are definitely movies. They are. They they have they have credits. They have characters. There is an audio track to each of them. They are one. I I can't for one single second deny they are most definitely movies. But don't try to claim that this franchise belongs to us straight and says people. When it was created by a gay man for other gay people, you know, I have, I've compiled some examples of LGBTQ stuff in the movie. So, Frank wants to interact with the Cenobites, which are a metaphor for LGBTQ people being themselves, you know, as an M, and perhaps especially express their sexuality. That's why they say they go beyond what other people do for experiences of pleasure, sex that isn't straight, but also as an M. But they can also be a source of pain from being discovered by hateful people, from the shame they might feel that they obviously shouldn't. The only way that Frank can do this is going to illicit places, like the place at the start of the movie. When he engages with the box, he is half-naked and alone in a place people don't know he is. Yeah, I, I don't think I have to make that one clear. After his LGBTQ experience with the Cenobites, people look at him different. He hides away from people afraid of how they'll react. Even people that, he you know, Julia used to be really hot for him, but now he's scared of what she thinks of him. What, she, what he looks like to her. Like many people falsely believe about LGBTQ people, he is actually evil. He corrupts other people, and whilst he himself doesn't kill very many people... Yeah, I guess really, the only... Did he kill that last one? He definitely kills... I'm almost certain he kills Frank. Uh, that's Larry. I don't think Julia had it in her to kill Larry. And he kills Julia, although intentional, unintentionally so. You know, his desires lead to a lot of murder, which, you know, that is, you know, people used to say, I guess, I don't know, I guess today the, it's more the the whole grooming, which is just a ridiculous stereotype. You know what, there are people who groom, but they don't tend to, it's, you know, yeah, on the long list of people who groom, I've seen far more cases where it is a Republican politician than the, yeah, obviously, you know, LGBTQ people are people, so of course some of them are, you know, some of them do bad things, of course, but if you want to get rid of people 
who like molest underage you know people you know i've i is there much of a real doubt that Trump is guilty of it. I feel like I the the details I've heard paint a pretty clear picture. There's no like there are witness statements. It's just that it hasn't been able to go to court because it gets slowed down or something. I forget the exact details. And then you have what was his name? Roy Moore, you know, just yeah. Anyway. But but yeah, for a while, you know, people would say, oh, you know, gay people, trans people, they're killers. You know, there are way too many movies where, yeah, they're, they're presented as killers. And, let's see, he almost at all doesn't interact with a member of his own family, Kirstie, until he literally pretends to be what he isn't, Larry. And, you know, metaphorically or otherwise, Larry Cotton is as straight and cis as they come. There is he is heteronormative. If if you look up heteronormativity in the dictionary, there's gonna be a picture of Larry Cotton there. Unless it's a misprint. I guess I can't you know, if you're if you go and do it and you don't find it, misprint, I guess. And one of the greatest fears of LGBTQ people happens, a family member realizes the truth about him, rejects him, hates him, thinks he's a monster. And something that scares him a lot is the idea of being discovered by the Cenobites. He is hiding from his LGBTQ identity, afraid of being clocked. Now, uh, yeah, so let's see. Yeah, um... Let's see. I'm not going to go into which or how many or anything like that, but at least, uh, actually, I think, no, what I'll, yeah, what I'll say is, I don't think it's a particularly interesting thing to do in this franchise to have an ending that reveals everything that happened was all in someone's head. You know, some of what makes the, you know, this and the second movie as scary as they are is that everything that happened happened. You know, there's there's really no, like, there's nothing indicating it or suggesting even remotely that, it, like... Think of how easy it would be to imply. Imagine if nothing strange happened outside of the house, of the homestead. You know, then it could be like, oh, well, I mean, maybe there's something, maybe maybe it was built on a, a shroom farm or something, and they're inhaling and they're having hallucinations. No, that doesn't explain the derelict. When he turns into a skeletal dragon and flies away, you know, it's not quite clear, are they in... Did the entire house burn down and they didn't have the effects for it, so they just set small fires? Or did they go to a different place with small fires? Whatever. But he, you know, 100%, they are not, you know, that... And, and he was following Kirsty. You know, he appears in the pet shop. He appears in the in the thing when, when she and Steve are going... You know, he is definitely there. There's no... Nothing... You know, and, and yeah, and when she goes to kick him out of the pet shop, like, we know there are at least two other people in there. The the kid who's just been told not to, to hit the glass of the snake, so he's probably not looking, you know, he, I don't think he's looking at the snake anymore, and I certainly think he wants to see, wait, who's being kicked out and for what? And you have the lady who's like, where is the manager? So she's also going to be paying attention to the, the comings and goings of Kirsty. I'm 100% certain... If one of them thought, she's talking to the air, is she okay? They would say something. So he's actually there, you know. So, so yeah, the, the, I do love some movies where everything is revealed to be just in someone's imagination, although obviously I cannot give examples without spoiling those, but I really appreciate that they don't do that here. I really love how the very first shot, you know, let, let's see, I guess the, the transition they do, I guess, is that 
the movie happens inside of the box or something, you know, the, the box is what makes the movie happen, something like that, and just, yeah. I really love that this doesn't overexpose Hell Priest and the other Cenobites, since some of the sequels do, especially if you sit down, you watch a bunch of the sequels, you know, yeah, over time, because Hell Priest, you know, he was popular, so he tends to look the same and act the same, sound the same. Now, let's see. I've been trying to figure out why the Cenobites claim want to claim people who solved the box without wanting pain and pleasure. The only thing I could come up with is maybe like a metaphor for homophobes, transphobes who want to hurt gay and trans people even when gay and trans people aren't flirting with them or anything, but yeah. If if you have a better idea and you might, I one hundred percent I realize that's flimsy, very flimsy. Please put it in the comments. I'd be very interested to read it. In reading it. So let's see, I guess. Yeah, something I'll just say, I really appreciate that this movie is not a slasher where teenagers who sin in monotheistic terms are killed off in Old Testament punishment. I'm I really, really boy was there a lot of the you know pretty much the vast majority of the slasher movies, you know, statistically, very few were not that. And let's see. So yeah, like I said, I definitely respect the second movie. The second movie goes to hell in content, aka we have such sights to show you, and the rest of the series goes to hell in quality, aka this isn't for your eyes, and it's a waste of good suffering. So, yeah, the, this movie and the short story established Hellraiser is supposed to be a mix of erotic and horrifying, not just scary or gross. And, yeah, not all the sequels get that right. You know, for example, Larry wants to have sex with Julia. Julia is scared that Frank, who looks scary even when he's not threatening, will kill Larry. You know, the sensual and horrific contrasted. And... Yeah, and in his writings and his movies, the ones where he had a lot of creative control, or where the people who had creative control understood his, you know, yeah. Clive Barker uses the sensory, both positive, positive sense, sexual arousal, as well as negative, rot and pain, more than just the threat of violence and murder. Because, again, you know, if all you want out of your horror story is violence or murder, pick any slasher from the 80s. It has it. But the this thing of, you know, making you think, ah, maggots, that's disgusting, and then having someone remember passionate sex, you know, is just... And, and she's like, she's moving in with her husband, who she's cheated on, you know, and the thing that she... Can, the thing she's thinking about is, is sex with Frank. And, yeah, so to, you know, I mentioned in the previous thoughts section about the religious theme, so the Cenobites are like clergy, they're very into bringing people into their world, where you will, you will be subjected to ritualistic flagellation, and, you know, yeah, the word Cenobite actually just means member of a, I, I'm just, I'm gonna make sure I get it exactly right, so, Cenobite, yeah, Ceno, Cenobitic monasticism is a monastic tradition that stresses community life. So yeah, a, a Cenobite is a member of a religious community. You know, if, if it wasn't for the Hellraiser movies and the short story, which is where it started, yeah, like, you could just, like, if someone said, you know, have you heard about the Cenobites, you know, like, if they're religious nerd, they might be like, oh, yes, the... Okay, so the there's Saint Pacomius, there's the Miletians and the Manichaeans, and various others, you know, and everyone else would be like, come again? And, let's see, yeah, and there are several references to Christianity. Frank ends up in a crucified position when the chains are, are pulling at him, when Kirsty hides from Frank, a, a Jesus statue falls out of the closet, which is also an interest. you know, coming out of the closet is also a, a thing, and, the, you know, the two that come out of the closet are 
the the statue of Jesus who I'm not saying anything I'm just saying 12 dudes you know 12 people followed him all of them dudes yeah and the the let's see and uh, yeah and and the the dead man who through being killed and then absorbed helps Frank pass And yeah, you know, honestly, yeah, the um, the mother of Frank and Larry Cotton was probably very religious. You know, there's also like um, I forget what they're called, but like stained glass something of of religion. You know, yeah, she was she was probably a real religious zealot, honestly, and it led to Larry being ridiculously safe. And it led to Frank seeking out extreme pleasure. You know, those are that is often what happens when you when you have an extremely religious parent. And let's see, yeah. And when she runs from the house with the box, she passes two nuns who clearly think that she has not been following the tenets. Like the way they look at her, they think she's into some some real like they're gonna pray for her tonight. They're not gonna lift a finger to help her, but they're gonna pray for her tonight. And that's you know, that's also like in the IMDB goof section and it's like that's true, but I mean if the if uh, in reality, nuns would you know, unless they're like, I don't know, on their break or something, like the nurse in rules of attraction. Other than that nuns are supposed to help someone who's in that situation but it's important for the film to establish this is a very non-christian kind of thing you know she's running around with the puzzle box the doorway to hell so she's not so so the movie's not going to have nuns helping you know it doesn't necessarily mean that Clive Barker has anything against nuns though you know possibly he has i haven't read anything he's said I do quite like the, the, you know, apparently they tried to claim that one of the movies was from the mind of Clive Barker, and he was like, it is not from the mind of Clive Barker, it's not even from my butthole. And, you know, it's, it, I don't know if he completely landed it, but I appreciate being that angry about having your, like, don't, don't invoke his name if he didn't help make the thing, just, that's, yeah. Haven't you wrung enough money out of the the cash cow that he provided for you? It's like just that's it's so disrespectful to bring his name into it. Anyway, yeah, you know maybe he does have a thing against nuns, but I don't think the movie is saying nuns don't have empathy. It's saying, you know, where what what she is involved with is not something they can help with. You know, it's it's too far gone. For, for them to, you know, maybe if it was an exorcist or something, you know, but she needs more than just some nuns. And something that I, you know, years ago when I would, when, when I didn't really understand much of this movie, I just realized, oh, it's, it's really scary. You know, one thing I would use as a selling point when I, you know, try to convince someone to, you know, I've, I've had the DVD since like 2000 something, 2002 maybe. So I've, you know, a lot of my friends would watch it because I, you know, said, you're, you're going to love it. And one thing I would point to is the last half hour or so is nearly nonstop tension and or horror. So this is not the only horror movie that features a mid-30s woman who is unsatisfied with her marriage, or from the time did tend to be about women in their 20s playing their age or 18-year-olds. It's the evil stepmom archetype, after all. There are fairy tales about how evil she is. You know, the, the I, I distinctly remember when I was a child, and they told me the story... Ah, uh, let me think. Hansel and Gretel, I think, yeah. With, with like, the stepmother's like, oh, there's not enough food for all of us. Let's send our two children out into the woods so they'll die of starvation or possibly exposure and we won't have to feed them anymore. And when I was a child, like, I didn't use that word, although I should have. I was like, bullshit. No woman is gonna do that. How much do you have to hate someone to, you know, it's, it's just because there was this hatred of the stepmother. But anyway, 
Yeah, it's... I, I'm not sure I know of any movie that came out before this one, and a lot, you know, there, there haven't been enough since, that had empathy for this woman. And it took a gay man to make it. There were tons of straight men directing horror movies before this. They could have made it, but as a gay man, he doesn't feel sexual attraction towards women at all. So his opinion of women doesn't change when they reach an age that a lot of straight men would no longer find them attractive. He, you know, he understands, well, you know, they feel sexual attraction. They want to reach orgasm just, you know, just like I do, just like the straight men I know do. You know, let's actually make, you know, and, and obviously you should not do what Julia does in this movie. But it is this thing of like, it, the horror is coming from the human, um, from a piece of human nature, you know. Like the reason Frank got in into the box at all which I realize sounds slightly like he shrinked and then went inside of the box. The reason he went to the hell dimension is because he wanted more. He wanted more pleasure. And Julia also, at the prospect of getting pleasure for the first time in all, you know, in all the years that she's been married with Larry, to Larry, she has not gotten sexual pleasure and so... Finally, she can have it again, and yeah, she is willing to, to kill for it, which I also, I forgot to write down, but that is a, like, because the stereotype is men who hate sex workers, and, and I realized that was actually, you know, it's not only a stereotype, it actually happened, uh, Jack, Jack the Ripper, you know, Jack the Ripper would kill sex workers because he hated female sexuality, and he thought that these women were doing something evil by you know, accepting money for having sex, because I guess he would rather they starve to death. And, yeah, you know, this movie take, takes that and, you know, flips and reverses it, and I, I quite appreciate that. Instead, it's a woman luring men, horny men, to, to their deaths. And, you know, and, and certainly, like, they might have been like, you know, okay, as long as I get to have sex with her, I don't care if I die, but they definitely did not want to just provide skin for a skinless dude, you know, that's not, yeah. Th um, Jimmy Carr has a, a joke where he says that he as a straight man is so attracted to, I forget her name, but, but a specific woman, that he would crawl over broken glass to suck the cock of the last man that shagged her. I don't think that's how these guys feel about Frank and Julia. So, yeah. Th they might feel it about Julia, but that's still not quite gonna, gonna happen. And I do also appreciate, you know, a lot of people joke about it, but, yeah, you know, when Kirsty knocks down Frank and runs, runs out after throwing the, the box, yeah, she hits him in the nads. You know, that's... And... and this thing of, you know, he's been talking about, oh, I'm feeling pleasure again, he can he can enjoy a cigarette, and he, you know, not, you know, yeah, once he has Larry's skin, you know, he has sex with Julia, but it does also mean that he can get hit in the, in the crotch. And that's also great, you know, if you want to say that a young woman can defeat an older man who's, like, taller than her, stronger than her, and much more used to violence than her, yeah, if she hits him in the nads, that's that'll do it. And it's also, you know, he's standing there thinking, oh, wow, you are hot, you know, and then she hits him in the nads, so that's, again, is that contrast. And, let's see, right, and, and you know, I don't even remember how I ended up going down this thought. Uh, let me, I'm just going to see how much... How many notes do I have left? Because my bag is... Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm close. So the... Yeah. <laughs> I think it's just because I saw someone say, you know, yeah, the writing's not great. This ain't Shakespeare. And then I was like, challenge accepted. I bet, I bet I can read Shakespeare into it. And I mean, okay, so here's what I got. Hamlet? Kirsty's uncle seduces her mother, kills her dad, tries to take his place, then he ends up dead. And for more Shakespeare, Julia definitely has a Lady Macbeth.
I may or may not have meant to do that Lady Macbeth thing going. And I, I really love when, you know, she is the, just the ice queen sitting, you know, thinking about after killing several people for, for Frank, and she's just, the, the coldness and the, the cool, because, because that's the thing, you know, like with Lady Macbeth, you know, what, what was it? Um, please remove the mother's milk and fill my breasts with snake venom or something like that, you know, and yeah, she's, she's not exactly a, a doting mother, is she? She, she lures men, she lures horny men using her sex, sex appeal and bashes them in the mouth with a hammer to, to make sure that she can have sex with a really hot guy. You know, that's not the most motherly and, and feminine, you know, these are, these are masculine things. These are stereotypically masculine things, you know, violence, um, deception, sex drive, these, these things, you know, I, I suppose actually, uh, deception, I think is supposed to be like a feminine thing. Yeah. Anyway, we have some messed up ideas of gender. Now, some say the movie does not do a good job of exploring one of its themes, perhaps the most interesting one, that pain and pleasure are merely different points on the same spectrum. I agree, I think it could be a bigger part of the movie, but, uh, let's see, yeah, first of all, it was not a common theme at the time, and as such, the censors took issue with it, and we see how ferocious they were in demanding cuts to this, and actually a lot of the cuts were... the the pleasure parts considering the monotheistic morality that dominates many horror movies I think they were afraid of showing hell as a potential source of pleasure rather than only pain I I am very grateful that Jesus wept ended up in the film I I gotta think like the censors must not have gotten it right cuz he's like I'm not gonna act it out don't worry but he's hanging there like chains you know his his face and body are penetrated with this hard steel and he licks his lips as if to fully appreciate the depths of the pain which is going to lead to pleasure and then he says Jesus wept as it is uh, like a mocking thing like can you believe Jesus got to be crucified and he didn't get how intense that is he couldn't appreciate the, the sexual pleasure that that kind of pain can bring to you. I gotta imagine, like, the the censors must have seen and been like, that's true, Jesus wept, Jesus died for our sins. That's deep. You, you can keep that one in the movie. I always say, remember, if we don't sin, Jesus died for nothing. You can't possibly be surprised that I'm taking so many swipes at Christianity when this is the movie I'm talking about. Now, let's see the, yeah, you know, even the, how, you know, this movie's version of hell is clearly very different from what we commonly think of hell as hell. Like, the Cenobites don't even remotely resemble anything I've ever heard of as coming from before hell, get, coming from hell before this movie. And, yeah, as is sadly the case with too many horror movies, it basically came out before people were ready for it to, you know, same thing happened with, you know, The Thing, and in general, a lot of John Carpenter's movies. You know, today, you have many movies that explore BDSM. Heck, the Fifty Shades trilogy presented as a romantic relationship rather than something straight out of hell like this does. And, you know, I have not myself watched the Fifty Shades films. You know what? Maybe at some point, I'll sit down in front of the TV and stab myself in the stomach instead of watching those movies but I do think that you know if you if you want some exploration of those films and and also partially of the books I can't believe I'm blanking on his name um, folding ideas did videos on the entire trilogy now some people seem confused as to why Frank can come back using the blood of other human beings Think of it like he's a vampire. He feeds on other people's blood for his own body, making it survive things that it shouldn't be able to. You know, I, I heard someone say, you know, yeah, it's basically, you know, he's a he's a zombie vampire. You know, he, he died, but now he's back from the dead in a body that's really ravaged, and if he sucks blood, he can come back to, yeah. 
Now, I think the movie also might be exploring transitioning either male to female or female to male through the character of Frank. For one thing, he's literally played by a different actor outside of the start and flashback, which is also why it's so impressive that we all remember the first actor so well. Like, you know, when 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 someone says Frank, Frank Cotton, like the first image in my head is like him, you know, standing in the rain or him having sex with Julia. And only after that, I think, oh, yeah, and then he's like the monster with the skin off. And, you know, finally, Larry, the, yeah, in, in Larry's skin. Just like the Cenobites, he has almost no screen the, the first actor for Frank, he has almost no screen time. So there's the obvious thing. Frank changes his body. The, you know, he hid away from people afraid of how they would react. There was a ritual to it. What I mean is he didn't just flip a switch for it to happen. And he never does change back to the way he used to be. He does it for pleasure, which is a common misunderstanding of trans identity. In order for him to gradually transition, his partner has to engage in multiple murders. For a long time, trans people were mistakenly conflated with killers. Sounds of the Lambs, for example. And Brian De Palma made several movies using that idea. Julia is at first upset to see Frank after he started his transition. And some trans people have shared that the process, the surgeries, felt like something out of a body horror movie. And in time, Julia comes to accept post-transition Frank, which is perhaps a reference to something very positive for trans individuals, that at least some of the time, their partners before transitioning still loves them after transitioning. They love the person, not the person's gender identity. And the movie can also be read as a metaphor for AIDS. This was made and released during the AIDS crisis. Frank's suffering in hell takes place far away from straight people, even when he thinks he has escaped, his body is still hurt very badly. And if you see the Cenobites as a metaphor for AIDS, then, you know, even if you think you have escaped it, you haven't, you merely postponed it, and if you come into can contact with the Cenobites slash AIDS, it will try to claim you. That's why Kirsty is threatened by them in that reading of it. I love the movie, and a huge part of that is the direction by Clive Barker, but at times you can tell that he is very new at it. He, and let's see, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, you know, there, there are some awkward, even strange moments, maybe especially in the acting performances, and since these are such talented performances, even newcomer who plays Kirsty showed a lot of promise, I honestly don't know why she didn't have more of a career than she has. Um, I don't know. Maybe it was one of those things where people kept thinking of her from Hellraiser, and so they had trouble putting her in other movies. Yeah. You know, either way, I hope she's happy with how, it, you know, she did, you know, I don't, I don't think there was any kind of contractual thing. She did choose to appear in at least one of the sequels, other, you know, other than the second movie, I mean. I think this movie does an incredible job at putting on screen for all to experience one of the single most horrifying concepts that anyone could dream of, living with family members after the age of 18. I will 100% grant I don't know why no one can smell Frank or the rotting corpses of his and Julius' victims. I mean, Frank himself must smell horrible, you know, even though he does have a nose, eventually at least. Yeah, I and, and spe especially the rotting corpses. Um, yeah. I don't know why some people feel that the, the, the movie needs to explain Kirsty's prophetic nightmares. I mean, I agree, it's really convenient, but isn't all divine intervention in fiction? No, it isn't. Anyway, I don't know why we need more an explanation than just she has some psychic power. You know, like, clearly, like, she basically sees coming, but doesn't realize at the time, Frank wearing Larry's skin. And, yeah, you know, each time we see what she's dreaming, it is some sort of... Like, there's also that thing with, like, the flowers. Like, I am terrible at reading metaphors into nature stuff but I guess like like the the blooming of a flower is like how layer uh, Frank is gradually getting more skin maybe 
I also don't know why some people feel that the movie needed to explain why the unhoused individual turns into a dragon skeleton and flies off with the box. Like, him grabbing the box is so that it isn't destroyed in the fire, but ends up in the hands of someone else. It appears that he was some supernatural creature that was to keep the box from being destroyed. Maybe that's why, you know, the derelict kept following Kirsty. you know, around. It senses that she would try to destroy it, and she did. Dude had one job, did it. The reason he takes the form of an enhanced, uh, unhoused individual, I need to read my notes more, is so no one questions why he never says anything, why he doesn't have a job, that kind of thing. And I think it's commenting on how little we pay attention to the unhoused. Clive Barker had a cop attack someone he mistook for an unhoused individual in the short story Dread. And this also helps explain why he went to the pet shop and ate crickets if it's a being that's nearly taking, merely taking human form, makes sense for it to feed off animals. And, you know, for those people who are like, they didn't actually feed him, no, he did not actually eat crickets. Note that you, I think you see his teeth, I, I think you, you see his mouth making chewing motions, but you don't see for sure him putting a cricket into his mouth and then chewing without them cutting you know he's the the crunching sound is almost definitely added in the editing I, I would definitely say that's what you know all that we do see is that there are crickets on like his his hand and and sleeve and some of his sh uh, shirt or jacket you know but that's it some people say it doesn't make sense that the merchant at the start wants a lot of money if you always consider the box to belong to Frank. I think it's one of those things where the merchant figured Frank simply wouldn't accept that the box was legit if he wasn't charged a lot of money. And why he asks for the box, with the box being the only thing on the table, presumably if he wanted something else, he would ask for that, then the vendor would go get it. He sells the box to those who want it and presumably has many takers. Putting it on the table cuts down on effort. Work smart, not hard. And if you see that box and not know what it is and express desire for it, the Cenobites want you. On several separate occasions, fingers are in mouths. It's scary when it's Kirsty and the, the, ah, uh, not Butterball, right? No, a uh, Chatter, Cenobite. It's gross and sexy. It's, it's sensual sexy when it's Frank and Julia. It's gross and sexy when it's skinless Frank. And let's see. Some people say it's too easy to see the demon running down the hole is being pushed on a cart. I have to say, I find it hard to believe that the first time they watched it, they could focus on that. And instead of like the, the, the face and the eyes and the teeth and the scorpion tail and this whole thing. You know, yeah, I, I didn't, you know, when I, when I read the engineer thing before on Wikipedia, I didn't read out loud. It's made to look like a combination of several real-life animals, and that, yeah, it's just, it's horrifying. When Frank is gradually brought back, we see the body parts. Let's see. Oh, right, that was the wax thing. So one of the potential pitfalls with this kind of deep fantasy story is that it ends up be only being about the lore. The characters get lost, but they do a really great job here. We do legitimately care what happens to Frank and Julia. It's not necessarily that we like them, you know, but they certainly are interesting, clearly defined, and deeply motivated. We might even be scared of them, hate them. I wonder how many men, after watching this movie, think twice before trying to pick up a woman in a bar. I'm not kidding. I would watch a movie that was about those two characters and didn't have Hell or Cenobites or anything. There's a lot of horror movies that I enjoy where I would not be interested in watching a version of the movie that did not have the external threat to characters. It really is no wonder that Frank and Julia did have screen time and character stuff after this movie, although they were eventually replaced by the Cenobites. Let's see. You know, basically, like, Julia was supposed to end up as a really major, yeah, I don't want to spoil, yeah, I'm just going to say, you know, yeah, eventually replaced by the Cenobites. You know, for, for sure, in my opinion, the main antagonists of this movie are Julia and Frank. You know, keep in mind, we're not talking about just one being with clear, understandable powers. We're talking about that in this movie, hell exists. It is very different in some ways that have been told by priests. Also, it is possible to escape from hell, but you will come back as a skinless creature 
provided that some blood lands on the place where your body was torn apart. In addition to that, you can gain more of your body back by consuming dead bodies. You know, and uh, like, I'm just going to say, nothing I have heard from any preacher had prepared me for what the Cenobites look like. And not just because they're not red, have tails, and poke you in the butt with pitch, pitchforks. You know, they have this pale skin as if there is simply no blood pumping behind it, and yet they move. They all have extreme body modifications that go far beyond piercings or body tattoos. You know, the woman's throat has been cut open. The wound is prevented from healing, being kept open permanently. I forget what they're called, but like surgical clamps or something. Butterball has his eyes sewn shut. Like, just touch your eyelids and realize how freaking sensitive they are. Now imagine needle going through repeatedly and and imagine you know to think about like it's it's kind of uncomfortable even just to close your eyes and like force yourself to be you know to, to not see for, for a long time imagine if your eyes were sewn shut like that and shatter has his teeth permanently bared like think about like your if your gums are bared even just like a minute or two, it's extremely uncomfortable. And for him, it's like that all the time, and has, has been for who knows how long. You know, like, we've all been to the dentist, except Bleeding Gums Murphy. This guy was the guy who, after the, the you know, after he was allowed to close his mouth, after the gums were covered with lips again, he was like, that was fun, I want to do that 24-7. His teeth are permanently chattering, which suggests intense fear, hypothermia, something equally painful and harmful. Uh, you know, a third option that's equally painful and harmful. I don't think there's any suggest any question that they must all be in extreme and constant agony. So that just leaves answering, why did they do this to themselves? Certainly they never expressed a desire to get away from the people who did it to them, the way that Frank expresses terror at the idea of the Cenobites finding him again. No doubt they tortured him and others who opened the box. So presumably they spend eternity in hell torturing and pleasuring themselves and everyone else there, you know. And I just, I love this thing of just taking, because it's, it's a logical, it's a logical, like, if... The devil is bad and is evil, the source of all evil, and he wants to torture, then why is it that the people he wants to torture are the ones who've done things that God says is are unacceptable to do? Like, if, if the... You know, if, like, if, we, if we compare it to human beings, like, the only way I could imagine killing someone would be to prevent them from killing someone else but if you're like uh, you know serial killers they kill people for pleasure if you're uh, like a bank robber killing people is like it comes with the job sometimes it happens you know that kind of thing so why is it that God is good the devil is evil if they have the exact same moral code like literally and, and in the Old Testament, God kills people all the time for breaking his rules. You know, so it just, it doesn't make sense. And Clive Barker's idea to twist it and say, no, 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 the beings of hell enjoy the torture. They they don't, it's it's not just that there's like, you know, they, they don't think, ah, let's see. Basically, for the Cenobites, if you're human, if you stay on earth you can't experience pleasure and pain the same as they so if you cross over you know that that's it and yeah you know the 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 cenobites only take those who desire extremes of sensual um input you know I love the movie but I believe in being critical of the things I love I will grant that a chunk of this movie features a lot of the same basic thing, like Julia luring men back to the homestead, murdering them, Frank absorbing them. Personally, I do think that they managed to make all the scenes distinct from each other. You'll notice, for example, Julia gets considerably better at it, much more comfortable with it as she goes. You know, by the end, like, you know, when, when Larry is like sitting and watching the, the boxing match, he's like, I thought you hated 
stuff like this. And she's just like, I've seen worse. Let's see. And I don't personally think that we've ever seen, we, we ever end up seeing so many of these killings that it ends up being, you know, the way that, for example, slasher movies, you end up feeling like, okay, whatever. You know, a specific, you know, as um, there's a number of people I'm going to see killed in this movie that's, you know, you, you kind of end up numb to it in a bunch of them. And just here, I, I mean, do they kill? I, th I think this, there's like three, you know. I do realize it was not necessary to show so many of them, three or four individual scenes of the killings. And I think if Barker had more experience writing feature-length screenplays, or maybe if he was able to work with someone who had, they would have been able to come up with something somewhat more varied. Yeah, something that might have been good is if there were at least different implements of, of killing, and if maybe, like, none of them come that close to just completely failing. Like, what if on one she accidentally, like, she, she forgot to to lock the door, or, you know, some, some kind of, yeah. Let's see, and, you know, I acknowledge the ending of the movie, as much as I love it, feels very different, almost incongruous with the movie that came before it, and it does kind of end up with Kirsty moving from room to room, being scared, like, it, it, you know, it, it turns into, like, um, a haunted house, kind of, like, it, I, I, I don't mean, like, a movie haunted house, I mean, like, you go to the, the, the carnival, and there's, ooh, there's a haunted house, let's go from room to room, and stuff, you know, jumps out of the sun, and go, goes booga booga boo, and, you know, in the homestead for Skinless Frank, in the hospital, it's the, I guess I'll call it the engineer, since apparently that is what Barker, yeah, and then the Cenobites, first in the hospital, then the homestead, then Frank in the homestead, wearing Larry's skin, Cenobites yet again, and then the engineer, it's effective, I'm always on the edge of my seat, but, yeah, like, it becomes a haunted house at a carnival. Going from place to place, screaming at scary things, up to that point, the movie had been so complex and intelligent, and again, I think Barker was just a tad inexperienced with the medium, just better at writing things that you had to read than a screenplay. I find the ending of the short story very effective, and I think it fits what came before much better. I realize it wouldn't have the same effect, but... Maybe it should have gone from Frank being pulled apart, wearing their skin, to the Cenobites going back into the box, and then Kirsty leaves. The rest of the movie plays out the same. She tries setting the box on fire. Home, the, the unhoused man grabs it, turns into a dragon skeleton. I have to say, I do not understand why Kirsty messes around with a puzzle box in the hospital and then runs down the dark corridor that opens when she solves the box. I know it's necessary for the plot, at least the box solving the running down the corridor, that's because they thought it would be scary, you know. I mean, she knows that Frank was terrified of the box. Did she not think he had reason to? And they threaten her despite her not seeking out pleasure and pain. I think... I don't... I don't take any pleasure, but a little pain, in criticizing the writing of someone as talented as Clyde Barker. But I have a suggestion for a rewrite. Yeah, I, I do work these in every chance I get. I like rewriting things. What can I say? I used to write. Now, let's see. Yeah, so maybe it should be that in the hospital room she fantasizes about hurting Frank and that activates the box which had been solved by Frank earlier, and he kept it so close, thinking it was safer, that his desire for killing to regenerate kept it close to reopening, and when the Cenobites come, they don't realize that most of that desire for killing was Frank's, then she's in denial about wanting to hurt him, then realizes they took Frank like in the film, and other than that, it plays out the same, and, you know, again, like I said, not the Cenobites, you know, chasing her through the, the house at the at the end. As it is, the last third is made weaker by their interest in her. You know, at least in the second film, they say it's desire, not puzzle-solving skills, that, that summons them, attracts them, something like that. I love movies like this where the threat is, you know, to this middle-class family living in, let's face it, 
quite nice house. I mean, okay, definitely some disgusting food needs to be gotten rid of, and a lot of skeletons in the closet, if you know what I mean. But it's a pretty expensive house. We're not talking about people intentionally going into a haunted house, people hanging out in a place where they know is dangerous or doing things they know are dangerous. The threat comes from within. In this movie, you're not killed by some evil that you had to awaken. You're murdered by your own brother, your own wife, who by this point don't think you have any value beyond your skin for regeneration. I think it's worth noting that Julia uses her sex appeal even more than she uses a hammer. It's how she lures men from bars to her home. It's like, it's how she gets Larry to stop wondering about the damp room. A lot of men think of a woman's sexuality as her primary worth. and Think of sex as something that men can take from women, something women can give men. They don't think of it as a potential tool women can use against men. Obviously, it's not the most empowering thing. It could be argued that the focus on her sexuality is demeaning to women. I would say for 1987, you know, an argument could be made that this was empowering, but for sure, like, if you are a woman and you feel like this movie was just disgusting for that, I 100% understand, you know, I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong for that. Let's see. Yeah, you know, I, I wish that Julia got to be the the villain more in this um, let's see. Um, yeah, I'm not going to give away, you know, I'm just saying it's not only this movie that she's a villain. And, you know, in some of the later sequels, she was replaced with Cenobites. I get why they are compelling monsters, although they're not. Are they evil in this movie? I mean, they're, they're barely even pushier than your average religious person when it comes to spreading the gospel, or since they belong to the Order of the Gash, the Gash Bull, if you will, and I hope you do. It just, yeah, I suppose, ultimately, they, they go a little too far to not be considered evil creatures, but... You know, Julia is such an interesting character. We can relate to her even as we realize her actions are evil. She chooses to do evil. We can't really relate to the Cenobites. And sadly, in the late 80s, the horror movies that turn into franchises were the ones where we couldn't particularly relate to the villain. You know, people weren't that interested in villains that they could relate to, which I think is much scarier with the... Um, I think both can be extremely scary. I think John Carpenter has made a career out of villains that are impossible to truly identify with. But I, I suppose what I will say is this franchise started out with two villains, Frank and Julia, who were easy to understand. Like, Frank goes further in his desires for pleasure, but... I don't think anybody exists who would truly, like, the, if, if they just, if they thought that they could just feel pleasure that was even more extreme than what they already experienced, that they wouldn't at the very least consider it. I, I just, you know, and that's again, that's something that Clive pokes at and points out here, you know. It's kind of human nature, like we, you know, and, and like obviously the, you know, the, the evolution, the evolutionary purpose is that pleasure from food means we eat enough to, you know, not die. Pleasure from sex means we procreate and, and, you know, so on and so forth. So, you know, it's, it's not this, yeah. And, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, and where a lot of monotheistic religion will say, ah, you know, but desire is evil. That is the first step to, to sinning. You know, Clive Barker says, well, maybe, you know, under the right circumstances, hell ain't so bad. Now, let's see, but, but yeah, you know, yeah, horror movies where we couldn't particularly relate to the villain, were the ones that got franchises. Jason Voorhees, Freddy Krueger, Michael Myers. Oh, right. Yeah, Jason Voorhees, Freddy Krueger. We understand where they came from, but they're far too sadistic for us to recognize ourselves in them. And as someone who loves the version of Michael Myers that we get in 1978 and the H40 trilogy, I 100% understand how terrifying someone that we cannot relate to is, but 
at the end of the day, Clive Barker wrote Julianne Frank to be relatable evil, and I really wish his vision had been respected and became the approach for the following movies. Now, you know, I guess ultimately a number of fans wanted something different, and I'm not above it. If I had been a teenager or young adult when, you know, yeah, the, the, yeah. If I had been a teenager or young adult when this and the second movie came out, I would probably have preferred, you know, yeah, it would be the Cenobites. And I know this because when I first watched, you know, I was a teenager and I did prefer the Cenobites. I was not emotionally mature enough to fully appreciate how terrifying Julia becomes. Now, uh, hold on. Is there really? Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, I'm almost through my holy crap. I did not expect to talk for three hours, but there you go. That's how much I love this movie and how much I, you know, want to talk about it. And hopefully you'll feel that I had stuff to say and didn't just ramble. Now, some people question, let's see, would Larry really not be able to tell there's something more going on with Julia? I think those people are just not fully acknowledging just how clueless many cishet men are when it comes to women, maybe especially their own partners. And I'm not saying I'm above it myself. I'm sure my exes would back this up. Again, this story was written by a gay man. Stereotypically, straight women can talk to gay men about their issues in ways they can't with straight men. Now, I have encountered one or two reviews that are misogynistic toward Julia. Sadly, a number of people just are not willing to empathize with women. The you know. I saw at least one reviewer suggest a divorce for Larry's sake. I would suggest one for Julia's sake. Just imagine, this woman has spent years of her life sad about being married to this guy, having spent all this time with him. They probably have sex every so often, which she maybe hates. Maybe she feels like she's being raped. You know, yeah, again, like, um, hold on. I think, wasn't that in the short story? Um, let's see. Hmm. I, uh, let's, yeah, yeah. It's at least you know Julia hates sex with Larry and imagines Frank in his place. And yeah, you know, the one time we see them almost have sex, he continues to try to have sex with her, even after she says no five times. And then instead of apologizing for t for continuing for so long, he berates her for how difficult a time he has understanding her. And, yeah, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, yeah, unlike way too many female characters, very frequently written by misogynists, in 80s horror, Kirsty is not weak or stupid. When she gets scared, she tries to do something about it. You know, yeah, she'll scream, but she's never just, like, frozen in place and doesn't try to think of how to get out of the situation. Some people seem confused as to why the house collapses at the end. One theory I've heard that I agree with is that near the end, the hell dimension is combining with ours, and that's destroying the house. So, the ending of this movie suggests that the next movie would start with a new person getting the puzzle box from the vendor. It wasn't supposed to continue to center on Kirsty. The character became more popular than expected. Kirsty caught on. And Kirsty sees Julia taking a man to the house, and just look at where Kirsty is. There is a woman outstanding in the field. Now, I've seen some say that when Kirsty says, go to hell, the female Cenobite starts to respond, says, we can't, but is interrupted. I agree that it can be hard to make out, but she does finish her line with, not alone. Now, Andrew Robinson starts out in this movie playing a good person, but a lot of his best work is as an outright evil character, Dirty Harry, or a morally ambiguous one, Garrick the Tailor, on Star Trek Deep Space Nine. That show where the planet Bajor has been occupied because they weren't keeping up with the Kardashians. So he's especially great in this movie after he starts playing we Frank wearing Larry's skin. So, if you believe in the patriarchy, Julia is evil because she's a bad housewife, and as a stepmother, a threat to the nuclear family. I, as a progressive, see it this way, because Larry is a partner who doesn't satisfy his partner, Julia, and let's be honest, if she married someone else, there's a good chance it would be the same situation, especially in sexually repressed 
UK or America, Julia chooses to do evil because she has no other way to achieve happiness. The true evil is not the friends we made along the way, it is the patriarchy keeping her in this awful situation. And yeah, you know, I mean, I, I tend to say that the only excuse, the, the only time where it is acceptable to use violence is if it can prevent greater violence. And I mean, she felt like it was violence against her to, to be married to Larry, you know, so yeah. And I definitely, I have a ton of empathy for anyone who feels trapped in a relationship that they can't really, yeah. So, that is it for this video. So, hit me up in the comments section, let me know what is your favorite Hellraiser movie? What is your favorite Cenobite? <sighs> Please don't spoil the 2022 movie. I haven't watched it, and I do care about spoilers for that one. You can spoil any of the other sequels. I, you know, like I said, I've watched a bunch of reviews of them, so... I, I know overall what happens in them and the twists and such. If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell like you're convinced it's wearing your dance skin. There should be a link to my main channel page, one or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on the movie, and one talking about my spoiler filled thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus Star Wars show, which these days is Andor. And recently, the reviews and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want my videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoy watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.